my name is Sheila Palmer Bednarski, and I was in the class of 1967. And after I graduated, I went to school at Odessa College. And I, I went there for two years and got my associate's degree. And um, I first started out with a major in anthropology, and then I decided after taking my first geology class that I much preferred geology. So I got um, my associates and then I went to the University of Texas in El Paso and where I majored in geology and minored in biology. And my first semester there, I met um, my husband, John Bednarski. And um, John had been um, one of the top runners in the world. He ran for England and they had recruited him to run for UTEP. So I knew there was an Englishman on campus and I was determined to find him. And sure enough, after about two months, I'd located him. And after I met him, we were together ever since. And um, that was, my goodness, that was a he didn't run. He didn't run too fast. No, he, he let you catch him. He let me catch him. That's good. That was November 1969. So I got my uh, degree in geology in uh, December 1971. I, I got married the day after I graduated. My father said, I don't care what you do as long as you get your degree. So the day after I graduated, I got married. <laughs> and then I knew that um, my husband was two years behind me. He didn't start school until he was 20. So I knew that we would be going back to England so I had to find a job in El Paso instead of looking for a job in the oil industry at the time. So we were married, um, let's say December 1971. We had our first child in September uh, 1973. Our name is Gabrielle. In, De in December 1973, we moved to England. And on January 1st, we got there. We had, um, my husband's parents lived in uh, Swindon, England. So we moved to Swindon. Um, we had another child, uh, Matthew, in November. And then unfortunately, Matthew passed away on New Year's Eve, 1974. And so that, that was sort of like the milestone in my life. After that, my whole thinking changed, and I became more family-oriented. And we had another child, uh, Christopher, in um, March 1976. Before we moved, uh, we moved from Swindon to a little village called Uffington in Oxfordshire. And Uffington is noted for uh, the white horse on the hill. And it's carved in chalk, and it's about, they reckon, maybe two to 4,000 years old. And it's a very stylized horse and prehistoric horse. So we were living in England for three years and three months. And the summer before we moved, um, we were living in a drought. And it was beautiful, it was hot. And then in the September, um, they had a minister of the drought. And then by, uh, the English government appointed a minister for the drought. And he said, it will have to rain every day between now and December uh, to break the drought. It started raining the next day. We left March 31st. It had rained every single day. And in, in December, I told my husband, we're getting out of here. And we moved back to uh, Crane in 1977 and we lived with my parents for a year and my husband uh, started working in the oil fields and then in 78 we moved to Odessa and um, in 1980 in January we had twins boy girl twins Nick and Danielle and I decided with four little children with the oldest six I had to get out of the house so I went back to school, to UTPB, and I got my master's degree in geology. And as soon as I got my master's degree, I told my husband, who was dying in the oil fields, that we could move any place 
he wanted to go and because the children were now all in school. And so we picked Albuquerque. So we picked up and moved to Albuquerque. We didn't have a job. We had four kids. And we had never regretted it. We have had the best time. My husband immediately found the running community in um, El Paso. So uh, my husband speaks fluent Polish. So all the runners who were from Poland who were training would uh, hitch up with my husband. And then we had all the Kenyan runners, and all the foreign runners. We had, we always had guests in our house. And then um, when we first moved to Albuquerque, it took us about three months to find a job. And I um, started working temporary as a document clerk at a law firm. And after about six months there, they asked me to apply to be a legal assistant. So I became a complex litigation legal assistant for 12 years. And I did that and I, um, after a while I could, at the end, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I went to work at the Human Services Department in um, the food stamps, Medicaid, cash assistance programs. And I did that for three years and that absolutely drains you. That is a very difficult job if you have any, any sense of feeling for people because you take on too much. And after that, I, um, I've always, just backtrack a little bit, but in 1998, I became a volunteer at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science in Albuquerque. And um, I worked in the geoscience collections, which is the paleontology, the fossils. And in 2005, after I left the Human Services Department and did a couple of other little things, I got a contract to, um, I guess we went to University of Arizona in Tucson and brought back, it's called an orphan collection. And they were fossils that were collected um, in the 1970s from the San Juan Basin, but they were New Mexico fossils. So the Bureau of Land Management um, gave the museum a grant and that's how they paid me to like them and got them and we organized them, cataloged them, numbered them, stuck them in the, in the uh, files. After that, um, I thought, I really want to work at the museum. I loved it there. So I got a job in the customer service department and I was um, selling tickets and keeping the calendar and um, just all sorts of things in the museum. One summer I ran a summer camp I um, really, really enjoyed it. And then I retired in um, three years ago, so 2014, on my 65th birthday. And um, I was gone for about a year. Um, and I went back to the museum. I got another contract. This time, um, Guadalupe Mountain National Park gave us their um, fossil collection. So it was my job to organize a number and catalog all the, all the uh, collection from the Guadalupe National Park. So then I did that, but then the contract was over. So now I'm still doing it because the job's not over, but it's a volunteer now. So I've been volunteering since 1998 at the museum. And my children are all grown. I have uh, seven grandchildren and um, I think my, my husband and I have been very happy. Um, Albuquerque is a wonderful city. Uh, it's just, we just had a lot of fun there. And that's where you are now? That's where we are now, and I expect we will be there. Our, our children live in, two of them live in Phoenix. One lives in Albuquerque, one lives in Arlington, Texas. So and our grandchildren are ages 3 to 21. And you have twins. I oh, have twins. Oh, your twins. The twins are 37. At the time they were born, they were the largest twins born at Memorial Hospital in Odessa. They had like a combined weight of 14 pounds, one and a half ounces. Wow. So that was, the doctor had told me, you know, these twins are going to come early. And they managed to come two days early. So I said, there you go. <laughs> well, 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 well,
So you, but you, you volunteer at the uh, museum, you say? Is that what you're... Right. I volunteer in the collections, um, and that means I do whatever busy work. The, a collection is like a three-dimensional library. So everything has to be cataloged. You have to know exactly where it is, where it came from, you know, who, who found it, where it, it's very important to know where it was found, if it was legally found, because we can't have anything that's illegal in the collection. Yeah. And we are the depository for all the uh, fossils found on the state and federal lands in New Mexico. So we have over 75,000 cataloged uh, specimens. And some of them could be like a whole dinosaur, that would be one number, or it could be like a tooth, that would be one. It's, it just depends on, on how it is. Well, that's a museum that's interesting to keep a record of activity and things. And oh, it is. It's very, um, it's like you're doing stuff um, just for the joy of the science of it. It's like you're improving the knowledge every day. Everything you find is one more point that hasn't been discovered before, or now someone will have access to it. And we do have a, a lot of the museum um, is research. So our, our scientists at the museum do a lot of research. Uh, we have like one, an ice age paleontologist. We have the dinosaur paleontologist, you know, the specialists. Specialists and, um, and they're world, world renowned paleontologists. And it's a really neat place to work. It's a very calming place to work. And I, I think that's why I enjoy it so much. Because it's quiet. I, and there's a lot, when I was with customer service, I sat in the middle of the museum and I would talk to people from all over the world, you know, all the time. And it's nice to have a nice quiet place to, to reflect and, uh, and to feel like you're making contribution to science. And science has always been my love. You got you, you got a master's in geology from UTPB, right? UTPB. Did, did you know Danny Davis for chance from our class, the '69 class? That's where he graduated. He Danny, got his yes, I knew Danny Davis. Actually, when I moved to Albuquerque, Danny brought up my my specimens from my master's thesis that I had left, and he and uh, the chemistry the chemistry professor I can't recall his name brought them up to Albuquerque for me. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah, he had, he went uh, he got his master's in geology from UTPB also, but I was at the same time. I think it was no, later. he he was there, but uh, we weren't in the same. I think he was actually he was younger, but I think he I mean I think he was a few. I had to, he was one of our classmates, and I just wanted that's interesting. You know? Yeah, we had a I did my master's thesis at a place called the Coal Mine Ranch, which was in Presidio County, Texas. It's about ten miles from the Mexican border. And it was all gated. Um, it was 30 miles of dirt road, the south of Van Horn, and then you turned off the paved road and you hit the dirt road. And a lot of times the road was just uh, arroyos that you would go down the arroyo and up the arroyo. And um, it was just a, a really interesting time in my life in the middle 80s. I have very little recollection other than that. I think that's because my kids were so young and we were so busy. I said, we have like a, I don't know, like a black hole in my memory. <laughs> so a lot of things happen, but I don't remember it. You know? Kids can do that to you. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Well, anything else you think of that you want to include? Um, There's always much. things you think of later, but it's, you know, it's, it's all right. Uh, I, you know, I, that's pretty much the highlights. I mean, we had, you know, things, of course, things happen in your life, but as far as my life, that's pretty much, I pretty, had a pretty quiet life, you know. How did you like England? You know, I really liked England a lot, If it, but I think I have, must have that seasonal affect disorder because of the, I just couldn't take the gray skies. I had to get back to the desert. And I remember when I was in England that I'd be gardening and I refused to put my hand in a bush. I, I said, 
But all these times, he's like, never put your hand in a bush, it could be a snake, you know. Of course, I don't have poisonous snakes in England that, that often, but I was, it took me a long time to put my hand in a bush in England. <laughs> well, that's where the change comes from there about the pain, wasn't it? You know, it was. I'm, I'm, well, it's probably good, you know, in your case, you probably, I, a lot of people like that. I well, you know, I, it was, I get very claustrophobic. Um, and like, when we decided to move to Albuquerque, we had the, considered moving to Fort Worth. But I said, I couldn't do it. It was too green. I have to have the desert. Mm -hmm. And I like to be able to see forever. You know, in Albuquerque, you can sit on the hill and you can see 100 miles. And to me, that, that's important. I don't know why. Yeah. It's important to me. Beautiful place. It is a beautiful place and has a lot of history and it's a very diverse culture. And I, I think that's why I like it because there's so many different things that can go on, you know. Well, thank you. Anything else? Seriously? I uh -huh. appreciate you taking time to do this. So. I hope you can I'm edit sure, that. I'm sure. It sounds so crazy. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> My name is Diana Thackeray in Appalachian, and um, uh, I remember uh, in school my senior year that Daryl Cohn and Jim Agnew used to ask me to come out to the radio station and read the, the news articles and stuff for them because they didn't want to do it. So I would go out, take the newspapers, cut out all the good stories, and then they'd say, well, you read it. What, we don't want to do it. So, so after a time or two like that, then after I graduated, then um, they asked me to come to the radio station and I worked at the radio station for seven years. <laughs> and so I did everything. I wrote the commercials, I, I typed the bills, I played the music, I read the news. I did everything from eight to five and nobody was there but just me. <laughs> and it was a country station, but so that was my, the first thing that I remember. Oh, was that yeah. Crane? Uh -huh, Crane, uh -huh. KBS in KBS, Crane, Texas. Okay, that's right. KBS, yeah. oh, and okay. so um, I, I got married um, the July after I graduated. I married uh, Rusty Earp. Uncle Ben was the city uh, police chief at the time and I married his grandson and, and our son Boyd was born in 1974. And um, he was a he was a good kid and still is and he lives in Plano and and has a young daughter six years old married a college a college friend and they were scared to death they were going to ruin their friendship by getting serious with each other and that was so cute and so anyway I worked at a couple of banks I worked at Amer American State Bank in Odessa and I also worked at Fort Stockton Bank and. Uh, about seven years, and then I worked for the TV station, KOSA TV, and wrote commercials. Well, I don't think I was very good at it because Dan Kalanak uh, didn't really like it, and so I was only there about three months, but I used to take all of the notes out to Admiral Foghorn when he was on live TV to give him birthdays and stuff that came over, so I thought that was kind of a lot of fun. But. And so um, I grew up and lived mostly in Crane. And um, I, uh, we bought a farm in Imperial, 30 acres, and raised uh, calves and, and high gear hay. And um, then we moved back to Crane and I went to work for Crane Well Service as an, in, an invoice clerk. And then Rosalie Dozier um, worked for Sheriff Raymond Weatherby in the tax office and asked, asked if I'd like to come to work there and Sheriff Weatherby hired me and so I was there for the next 16 years and ended up tax collector and people used to say, Diana, what are you campaigning for? Nobody's running against you. <laughs> I said, I just want you to know I'm not taking it for granted. So I really enjoyed the tax office. I ate, slept, and drank that job. It was wonderful to help people and, and I really enjoyed that. And, Later on in life, Rusty and I got a divorce and I moved to Austin and I've been in Austin ever since and um, uh, I was single for about 10 years and then I met Marvin and we've been together for 12 or 13 years now and so 
Um, I went to work for the law firm that collected the delinquent county taxes. And they, I was the president of the Tax Assessor Collectors Association one year and saw Mr. Leinbarger and he asked me to come to work for him. And so I've been there for uh, 22, 23 years and I handle the client database. Uh, we're the nucleus uh, for all these modules that come off of it and we're the nation's largest collection firm for cities, county, schools, law, um, you know, special districts. We do towways and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I don't have anything to do with the collection part, but I'm really proud of our law firm because our phone banks care about people and they um, make sure that they're trying to help people because most people want to pay their bills and there's ways that they can. So I'm really proud to work with them. So. Marvin had been in prison ministry for 18 years and he had gone to all the prisons in Texas and in Angola and, and in Oklahoma and Louisiana and, and I got to do prison ministry for a couple of years um, there at the state jail in Austin and I really enjoyed that work and I really enjoyed um, knowing and growing up in the Lord with Marvin because um, he pastored for that long period of time and I've grown and and it's just been fun being married to Marvin. I enjoy it a lot and and so I have one granddaughter. Her name is Hattie. She's six and Marvin has two two girls and one boy and we have seven granddaughters and one grandson. And so life is good and and um, one of the highlights of my life was I got to go to Israel one time and I remember feeling so overwhelmed when I got off of the airplane because it was just wonderful to be there and um, that was one of the biggest experiences of my life so I've done a little here and done a little there and had a good life and I'm still working and I enjoy my job so much and and we're going to try to move from Austin. Don't know where we'll go or what we'll do, but I'm excited about life. But, but it was a pleasure being in this class with all of these brilliant people. I mean, it's unreal to see how many occupations and just high-level jobs like Eddie Smith comes to mind to me, all of the stuff that he's done, and, and it's just been great. Crane has a bunch of good people uh, yeah. come out of there. Uh, mm -hmm. And you mentioned Uncle Bill. Uh -huh. When I was, uh, this is not my story, but I, this is uh, 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 when I was in fifth grade, I guess we were safety patrol guys, you know, we helped watch down there and watch people coming across by the elementary school. And, and he would always park his car right there. And I'd get there early so I could sit in the car with him for a little uh -huh. while. I still remember that. He'd let me sit. He had his police car, you know. And, oh, I thought I was big time. I just, whatever, five, fifth grade would be, what, about 12 or something, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, 11, 12, something like that. Yeah. He was so nice to me. Yeah, he was a very nice man. Mm -hmm. I remember one other thing. I was really active in the community at Crane. I was the first woman that was ever asked to join the Crane Noon Lions Club. They allowed women to finally come in and they asked me to be the first woman and I enjoyed that so much. It was quite an honor and whenever I got ready to move to Austin it took me about two weeks to quit everything that I'd been involved in and I haven't joined any group uh, since then. So <laughs> Was Mr. Crane still uh, in the Lions Club when you were there, Doug Crane? He, he, in, you would have known if he was. He, he, had, he had a stroke years ago, and I think it was probably before that, that time, but he was real active in that. And I went with him out selling mops and brooms when we was in school there. Uh, uh, first occasion I ever had to go into Colored Town, they call it, and some of the nicest people. He knew everybody down there, and they yeah. were some of those wonderful people before we integrated. And, uh, a little apprehensive about going, ah, oh, come on, Bob. He has a little pickup. We drove down through there. He had big heart and open arms, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He was a wonderful guy. Here. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Uh, we'll uh, expect a call from TMZ to see you. And, and <laughs> I don't know <laughs> why. <laughs>
Okay. So you were for KOSA. I did for yeah. a short time. Oh, that's what we listened to growing up. You know, we had Channel yeah. 7 was the only station we could get um, that was reliable. Uh, we could get Channel 2, which was KMID one in uh -huh. Midland, and mm -hmm. whatever the ABC affiliate was in Monahans, I think. Very seldom could we ever get it. But, so CBS is what I grew up on, Walter Cronkite and all that much, you know, and, and uh, the KOSA. And, and there's a couple of people in the Dallas market from there, and I'm trying to remember the names. Uh, they're, they're on, uh, one of them's on uh, Channel 11, which is a CBS affiliate there now, I think. Uh, My son's an auctioneer, uh, and he does a lot of benefits, big brothers, big sisters, and does a, a lot of school auctions and all that kind of stuff in that area. Really? So he, there's one of the the newsmen that he works with at a lot of these, that it, he emcees them, and, and Boyd just does the auctions. Oh, huh. well, yeah, the, most of the guys up there seem like they're, uh, you know, these people are pretty... Uh, friendly in the community. You know, I know it's their job to be that way, and some of them, that's probably all the only reason they did. But there's a lot of them seem like to have a sincere interest in really being out in the community and, and doing a lot of that kind of you know we see them all the time and stuff. But uh, huh. now, where's your son now? He lives in Plano, Plano, and he and his wife have a an, an office furniture business. Oh. Uh, over by Reunion Tower, where that new bridge is, they're down in the warehouse district, and yeah. it's called Rhodes Office Furniture. Oh, okay. And it's uh, some, I don't know if I use the proper terminology, but some refurnish, some refurbish, some mm -hmm. new, that kind yeah. of thing. So. Oh, yeah, we know right where all that is. We go to church downtown and drive down that way all the time. Oh, wow. Regularly, yeah. so they drive, They live in Plano, but their office is in downtown Dallas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's a family business. Mm -hmm. Furniture. That's good. We'll have to, now, what's the name of it? Rhodes Office Furniture. We'll, we'll have to check that out sometime. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Anything else you want to go? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sherry Trotter Dyer, and I graduated in 1967, and I wish my classmates that couldn't attend could be here because we're having so much fun. After I graduated, I went to Odessa College and received a secretarial degree, and I worked for El Paso Products at the time, and then I married and had two children, Jennifer and Tony. I divorced my husband because he was verbally and emotionally abusive, and I went to work for a medical center hospital. That's where I met Morgan Dyer. And Morgan is a pathologist, was a pathologist there. He's retired now. Uh, after I left medical center, I moved to Kansas. And I was working for a drug alcohol abuse center and also a mental health center. And I love my job. In 1996, I came down with a terrible case of pneumonia. And after that, I discovered I couldn't lift my hands or make up the bed or do anything without just almost passing out. So I went to the family doctor I was going to. He did an echocardiogram and he sent me right on to Topeka, Kansas to a doctor named Dr. Flatt. And Dr. Flat did a, a heart cath, and I was in congestive heart failure. So he put me in the hospital. That night, he came in and told me that I had to have a heart transplant. And that was a big shock. He said I had about two years to live if I didn't transplant. And he told me to go home. I had support at home. Texas was a bigger state, and I had more of a chance to get an organ. Well, uh, Morgan and I, uh, he was still working and we got to travel some, but it was really tiresome for me. And not in 2003, I really got really sick. We think I had West Style virus and I think that finished off my heart. But in 2004, I waited on the list for five months, which was a blessing. Anyway, in 2004, I received a call from the transplant center that they had a heart. 
and Morgan and I got to Dallas, had to be in Dallas in two hours. And uh, anyway, I transplanted at 12 o'clock on the 24th. And we live in Midland now. Morgan's retired because I had to stay in for a year. I couldn't go to Walmart, restaurants, anything it, because I was so immunosuppressed. And uh, he has four children. Uh, a girl and three boys, so we're a blended family of six now. We have nine grandchildren. Most of them live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, so when I go for checkups, I get to see them. And wonderful, awesome grandchildren, which we love very much. And I'm doing well, and Morgan's doing well, and so I guess that's it. Good, good. And you had a recent checkup and your heart was doing the fine one. Right. right, yeah, yeah. That's been what, 13 years? I, I, yeah, I'm out 13, 13 years. 13 years, okay. It's unbelievable. It's amazing, isn't it? I'm blessed by God. So Feel a lot better now. Yeah. yeah. I know, so that's good. Okay, is that? That's it. That, is that it? That is it, yes ma'am. Oh, good, thank you. Somebody else. Uh, my name's Terry Mars. I graduated in 67, and after high school, I uh, went to Florida for the summer, stayed there, was planning to go to the University of Texas, and instead uh, went to school in California. Stayed there for a year, and uh, went to Odessa College for a semester, and then I went to Tech. I finished at Tech, and I crammed a four-year course into five years. Uh, I think I graduated with 172 hours uh, as an undergraduate. And then um, after tech, I went and taught at Coronado High School for five years uh, as a theater teacher. Uh, then I went back to school and got my master's uh, at tech. And uh, from there, I went to Odessa High School, taught for four years. And then from Odessa High School, I went to Sonora High School. I was there for um, eight years or somewhere in that area and uh, decided I'd be a principal. And so I taught school for 17 years and then I uh, was a principal for 18 years. I was a principal in Sonora. I was an assistant principal in um, uh, Austin at a alternative school. Uh, we had about 350 students in that school. Uh, and I was a principal then uh, in Bront. I started out as a high school principal in Sonora because I was never at home gone almost every night of the week, I decided to uh, become an elementary principal when that opened up. And then I went to Bronte as an elementary principal and ended up a high school principal. So after 35 years of being a principal, uh, I decided I'd, uh, being working in education, I retired. Uh, since then, I went to Thailand and got an international teaching certificate and uh, really enjoyed that experience. Um, I do photography some and uh, I have uh, a couple of acres in Bront. I have goats and dogs and uh, am being very uh, entertained in my retirement. Now you mentioned, I uh, heard talking that you do uh, judge uh, 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 debates and, uh, or not, is it yes. debates or? Uh, well, I, I judge. Uh, plays. Yes, I plays. judge one act plays for UIL, but I also judge uh, speech tournaments. I judge debate. I judge uh, uh, all of the other events, but uh, I, I've judged one act plays now for about set, uh, eight, ten years, and uh, that takes me all over the state. Uh, it's really interesting because uh, 
I, I probably have seen more schools in the last 10 years than most people do their whole lives. Do you, do you, do you judge all over Texas? Do you go yes. to the states or do you have is it like for your regional or state? Well, or I, I, yes. A matter of fact, this year I think I have a, a 1A by district, a 3A district, a 3A by district, a 5A area and a 6A regional. So I, I go to every size school and uh, at every level. Did you enjoy the elementary or the high school? It's different, I'm sure, but... It's, it's very different. Uh, I loved the elementary. I like, de you know, it's, a, it's just a lot better job. Uh, in high school, you're dealing with so many serious problems, and in elementary, you're dealing with uh, problems that you can actually deal with. But uh, I, I was never happier than I was as, a, as an elementary principal. Now, I, I was happiest, I guess, teaching. I enjoyed teaching. What class, what subject did you teach? I taught theater and speech. Uh, in, uh, uh, I taught theater uh, all of the years that I taught, and I taught speech about half of them. I taught debate. Uh, I had several students go to state and debate. Uh, some of them even place. And uh, uh, so I guess that's how I ended up debating. How was your trip into Thailand? So you went there? Yeah, I went to Thailand. I went there for six weeks and uh, went to a school and got my uh, international English teaching certificate. Uh, I'm certified to teach English in any country in the world. That's interesting. Do you plan to do that? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, when I got back from Thailand, uh, I got back in December of, I don't remember what the year was, it was 10 years ago, so I guess it was uh, uh, 07. Um, but when I got back, I, in January, the following month, uh, uh, year, and 68 of January, I had a head bleed and uh, spent uh, two weeks in critical care in Dallas. And uh, that pretty well did it for all of my uh, work and teaching and other things. Are you all right now? Everybody? Yeah, I'm fine. I, I, the doctor said that I was one of 5% uh, that didn't suffer any great problems or die, so I felt good about that. That's good. Well, anything else you think of? Good no, I, I, you know, I, I guess I think I've lived a pretty boring life, but <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, fine with me. <laughs> I, uh, I'm busy all the time. You know, I thought I would retire and not have anything to do, and now I've got more to do than I ever did. Where do you live? I think it, I live in Bront. Bront, Bront, okay. Wow. Well, it's a, it seems like that's what I hear a lot. People that are retired are so busy they don't. They might have to go back to work so they can rest. That's true. Uh, I went back to work uh, three years ago. Bront lost their principal and superintendent in the same week. And they called me and asked me, would I do the high school principal? And I agreed to, I said, I'll do it as long, you know, it's supposed to be for until they could hire another principal. And it ended up stretching into the whole year. And after that year, I said, no more. I'm not. That's it for me. Challenge it. That was it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I haven't even substituted or gone up there since then. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, thank you. Oh, it's, uh, it's fun to hear these stories. I just love this. <laughs> like I say, well, most of us, after we left school, uh, we didn't really, a lot of us saw each other some, but 
Some of us haven't seen each other at all since. Now, there, there are people at this reunion that I haven't seen in 50 years. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Since I graduated from high school. Yeah. Well, that's kind of a good way to connect. Yeah, it is. Get a little bit of... You know, it, it's really interesting when you're uh, kind of preparing for a reunion like this. I mean, in my mind, I thought of everybody as they were when I graduated with them. <laughs> they, they've changed. <laughs> and, <laughs> Oh, We've and added then, a little weight. Yeah, a, hair. a lot less hair, <laughs> a lot more weight. A lot less hair, more yeah. weight, yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm Freddie Pomeroy. Uh, went to University of Texas with uh, Jimmy Johnson and Dana Palmer and Larry Williams when we graduated high school. And uh, that was our sophomore year with John O.C. We went there wow. and then uh, my junior year, I was uh, fortunate enough to marry my love of my life, Debbie Darden, and uh, we've been married 48 years. Have three children, eight grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. And uh, so we went through school in Austin, and then I got a job, and we moved down to Victoria, where our son was married, uh, married or was, was born. And then uh, I went to work, uh, work for Del Monte Foods for a few years as a salesman. Then I came back to Odessa and worked in the uh, supply industry for, we provide uh, pipe, valves, fittings for the oil industry and I worked for them for uh, basically off and on 40 years. So uh, we, we grew up here in Odessa. And one of the things that happened in my family was that our, our son was, uh, loved to play football and he was part of the Permian program when coach Gary Gaines was there. So Matt was there and was uh, became a starter on Gary's team during Friday Night Lights 1988. So uh, Gary had put me on his board and so I got to meet the author of Friday Night Lights so we lived all of that and how all of that happened and uh, uh, and you know, that was kind of a special time. And I want to say something about Gary. Uh, I think, honestly, the best thing that ever happened for my son was playing in his program because it wasn't about Permian football, it wasn't about winning state championships like the book said or any of that. It taught him hard work and dedication. And he's, uh, he's very successful in his life because he works hard and he's very, very dedicated. So uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I was telling Gary that, but uh, he should be very proud uh, of, you know, what, he, what he's been able to do. I still love to play golf, uh, do a little bit of traveling. And my wife now, uh, Debbie, is uh, her, her, she's not able to travel any longer. So, you know, we have a pretty quiet life. And, uh, uh, enjoy it very much and for a little period of time about I guess 10 11 years we owned our own company over in Midland we owned a uh, oil change shop and that shop uh, uh, really truly blessed our family and through those efforts and what I had learned going through life and uh, you know was able to put into practice owning my own company and uh, that, that pretty well set us up for retirement and, you know, the rest of our lives. So, you know, that's, uh, I, I, heard, I heard some of the other guys say I kind of have a boring life. Mine, I'm not spectacular. I've never done anything that's uh, nationally newsworthy. But, uh, you know, I feel very good about, you know, the things that uh, I've been able to share with my coworkers and my friends that I've worked with over the years. and. Hopefully I've helped their lives, and uh, because I know they've enriched my life, and that, that's been good. Yep, uh, you have a place in uh, Rio Dosa? Yes. You take the back and forth between there and here, don't you? That is correct, yeah. We actually, it's in a little town called Alto, just right beside of right. Rio Dosa, and it's, a, and it's got, it's like, almost like a log cabin. It's got an acre of land, and you know, the deer and the elk and the turkey come in, and it's so much different than here. And, you know, it's really, really nice. Uh -huh. Wow, well, that's something. Yeah. Well, good. Anything else you think of? No, no. Uh, Bobby, thanks. It's 
so much for doing this and uh, uh, you know you just feel like you're part of our class and you know everything that we've done. I'm a lot younger than you though, see? I'm yeah, you're a lot younger than I am. But My it's wife not, probably. you know really Bobby, it's not hard to be younger than me. <laughs> Most of the people are. I find out Most as, people, as we get older. My mother, my mother is still alive. She's 95 years oh, old. Oh, wow. And, uh, Where does she live? Uh, she lives in Midland. I call her, uh, she, uh, tell her all the time that she's as mean as a junkyard dog. And that she used to, I would have been six foot eight, but she beat me every day. And so only ended up being, you know, five, eleven, six foot. And uh, she always laughs and has a good time. So, so to us. Yeah. Good that your parents can be around, you can enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. A, and your comments about Gary, he, uh, he, uh, he's he, uh, a special guy. It, yeah. It just, uh, you know, uh, people don't know, I, I think sometimes you don't know the impact you have on other people in their lives and what, you know, touching them and what you do. Because, you know, you, you, at the end of the day, you work all your life and and the day you leave, they, they find somebody else to take your place. And hopefully, though, that you have made some kind of difference in somebody's life. It doesn't matter whether you, you know, I guess it does that you've made a difference in the company, because I think I did. But, you know, I, I know for sure that some of the people that I've worked with, that, you know, I was able to help them, you know, find a way and, and do, do their life with. Just like, uh, some of our teachers, Pop McLean, uh, Mr. Crane, some of those guys did for us. Uh, hopefully, I was able to do for them. Yeah, we had some good teachers there. Oh yeah. Uh, good teachers. Terry was mentioning about uh, his being a principal in the different schools. You know, mm -hmm. having guys like him mm -hmm. as a principal to guide the little kids. Yeah. That's uh, a. Yeah, it a, is. It is, and it's a calling. Nice. You know, there, there's. Uh, there's uh, somebody told me one time that uh, there are those that are called and those that went, <laughs> and uh, it, uh, you can tell the difference. You know, those that were called to do what they do. I've heard that. I've been around church all my life, and I've heard that as far as speaking about ministers, yeah. and I think that's and, definitely and, true there. And I think well, it's, it, it's true, Bobby. Uh, you know, all of the uh, uh, if I, if I didn't learn anything else, there's laws in the world. Just as sure as gravity is a law, giving is a law. Just as sure as, as uh, uh, you know, the things that God put together for, you know, to create the earth and the universe and everything, the laws that dictate what we do every day, there is spiritual laws. And if you give to others with, with no connection, you just give to them, then you'll receive back. Yeah. You, and if you don't care what you receive back, but you will, yeah. you know, there will be that blessing. And, yeah, your and it's not, cool. It's your, really your, cool. Your intention was not to get a... Oh, that's right. Uh, you don't give so that you get richer. You don't give that you, uh, uh, you know, that you, you, that you can become spectacular. You give because you want to so you can, you know, help. And, uh, and there's a lot of other ways to give than other than money. Money is probably the least important way yeah. to give. Well, I hope Debbie's all right. You say she's not able to travel a lot. That's correct. Yeah, she has what's called fibromyalgia, and uh, and she uh, is in tremendous amount of pain constantly. And uh, uh, it, uh, you know, we still have a wonderful life, and but uh, you know, it's just it's it's limited. Yeah. And she was not able to come with me to this reunion, but uh, you know, she's here in spirit with yeah. me. Well, tell her, Mr. Ann, because she's one of our class. Yeah, that is correct, Bobby. That is correct. And kind of like your wife, she came in from New Mexico, you know, junior year or so, and and kind of mailed it into, uh, you know, us in Crane. And, she just came in her junior year. I thought she yeah. was there longer than I did. No, I just, no, she came in from Artesia, uh -huh. and, uh, uh, and and I, I met her at uh, uh, with Dana Palmer and Jimmy Johnson at uh, First Baptist Church. Yeah. So. Well, but I just thought she had been there long enough. Yeah. Was, but I, when yeah. you missed that that. But her, you know, her, her uh, sisters grew up on, you know, came on through Crane. And, yeah. And yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, the Dardens became part of the, part of Crane, just like, uh, you know, you, so you guys and my, my family. Yeah. And my mother, uh, you talking about uh, liking what the, my mother just loved to teach me, you know, she, uh, 
Sorry, I got sinus. That's right. I've never seen and I've never seen anybody love to teach more. And that's kind of the environment that all of our teachers. You know, there's yeah. a few exceptions, but most of them there. Our the teachers way. back when we were kids, uh, I think they loved their job. I and so. I'm not saying the teachers today don't, but uh, you know, they, they, just like Terry was talking about, you know, his life and and, and what's going on. You know, uh, gosh. I don't know where I'd be without the the schooling and the melding that I had, and you know the foundations that that, that developed, uh, along with my family. Uh, you know that that served me well all through my career. Yeah. Well, I think that's. I think we got a good start. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh yeah, Appreciate thank it. you. This is cool. This is cool. Yeah. Go Golden Cranes. Yes, go Cranes. Go. <laughs> Hi, Becky Hanson Clark. Now. Uh, left the school and went to Angelo State, uh, roomed with Linda Montgomery, for those that remember her from the eighth grade. Uh, I had a good time there, lots of fun, and met my uh, husband, George Clark, uh, there. We dated for quite a while, and then I decided to transfer to Texas Tech and he stayed at Angelo State and graduated from there. I graduated from Texas Tech uh, in kinesiology. I uh, wanted to always be a uh, gym teacher and coach. We got married in 1972 in Hobbs, New Mexico because he was working for Hughes Tool Company. And shortly after that, uh, I was pregnant with our first child uh, and we named her Cynthia Scher. Uh, lived there for a while, then moved to Odessa. He changed jobs. Uh, we were in Odessa here for about six months and changed jobs again and went to Midland. We were there for quite a while. Uh, second child was born, Benjamin Lee. Uh, he was four when we moved to Conroe. George got a big promotion and headed to Houston. And we have lived in Conroe for 36 years. So our children went through the Conroe School District, uh, both graduated there, and have gone on and uh, gotten degrees. Um, George retired a couple of years ago uh, with the company, and after the kids were a little bit older and I had been Girl Scout leader, Boy Scout leader, room mother, stay-at-home mom, uh, I decided to do some substitute teaching just for a little bit extra money and I did that for about four years and then I was called to uh, be a sub for six weeks on maternity leave for this coach at a junior high there in Conroe and uh, I did that for six weeks but the funny part about it that I was playing tennis at the time on a league on Thursdays and I told them the only way that I would take this job would be if they would get a sub for me on Thursdays so I could still play my tennis. And they were so desperate, they agreed. So they had a sub for a sub during that time. Finished that, went ahead and did some substitute teaching. And they called me that December and said that the teacher was not coming back. And uh, they were impressed with me there for that six weeks did I want the full-time position. So George and I talked about it. We had one in college and one wanting a, a car and we decided it was time for me to go to work and kind of help with the income a little bit. Took that position and I was a junior high girls coach. I coached volleyball, basketball, track, and tennis. You just kind of went with what the season was for these girls. So seventh and eighth grade girls um, did that for 10 years and decided uh, 10 years was enough and I retired got involved with playing golf and, and tennis again and have just enjoyed that. Um, got back into my art that I enjoyed in high school and I'm taking some watercolor classes and doing that again. So just enjoying the, the grandchildren. They live close and like I said, we've lived in Conroe for 36 years and we will stay in that area because that's where our grandchildren are. And that's where I am today. 
Do you are you in the band? <laughs> Do you, oh, in I high remember, school. I know you were in the band. Yes, because you were our drum major. Yes, I was in the band. Do you play uh, all the way from fifth grade till graduation? Played the saxophone, played the alto sax during marching season, played the tenor in some of the concert seasons. But senior year, I played the bass sax, the big one. Do you still play? No, have not. Uh, actually, the sax that I played was on loan from an uncle and we returned the instrument to him, and I have not not played since. Really? You ought to try sometime, it's amazing. I was kind of like that, I played trombone, and I didn't play for years, and I had a church out to you. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much you remember. Really? To have uh, to polish I've, your skills with. Well, really. I've thought about <laughs> it, and I'm thinking, I don't remember what, what fingers to cover the I'm, keys on which note, so. I, I bet you'll pick yeah. it up, it is a thought. Could be. Uh, so you're come from Conroe? Yes. All right. Well, now your mom's still living, uh, you were talking about, she's right. 91. Right, mother's still living. She was living uh, in the valley, uh, far Texas. Had been for 30 something years with my dad and, and lived down there and uh, just I had an illness and we t talked about it and I told her she needed to move closer to one of us kids because I was the closest one and it was a eight hour drive to get down there or an hour in the airplane, so. We've got her close. She's like 10 miles away from me now. She's 91. Well, that's something. Yes. That's yes. something else. Uh, anything else you can think of? Uh, I don't think so. You went to school all at 12 grades and trained, didn't you? Yes. Oh, there yes, was first grade through graduation. Uh, all of us, four children, the handsome kids, uh, they had a chance to be transferred once, and mother said, no, I want, I want the kids to all go to the same school uh, so they can remember uh, each classmates and, and different people and really enjoyed the schools so that was a blessing right? that was that was a blessing, a blessing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jackie and I were driving around over in Crane today and we said you know it, it's a small town it's uh, kind of out in the country but what a place to raise a family and the schools were so good and it was just the right place to grow up at the time we grew up uh, that they've got such beautiful schools. I, I miss the old buildings, you know. Yes. I, I saw yeah. some of that, but they they're nice and right. It's uh, it's uh, uh, I feel fortunate to have grown up mm -hmm. there too. I thought that was a, that was a real right. blessing. Really. Yes. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for doing this. Oh, it's just a lot of fun. We'll uh, we'll get all edited here and online in a few days. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, thank thank you. you. I appreciate it. Oh. Who else is out there? Do you know? Yeah, cut. <laughs> you know, I thought of some things I were going to say, but then it, it kind of... That flowed really well. Yeah. Well, when I was... Well, go ahead. No, we, no, 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 no. I don't want you splitting and adding. Oh, we had adding but, stuff. Uh, when I was at Angelo State, my freshman year, they, they had this course that you could take to be a lifeguard. So I went to, this, to Central High School, was where the course was, mm -hmm. and took the, the course. And I was a lifeguard at the Air Force Base that summer after my freshman year there. And then, you know, went to school my sophomore year. And I think at the end of that year, I went back to Crane and I was a lifeguard and taught swimming there at the pool in Crane that summer. Oh. And I was going to throw that in. But, you know, you get to talking and you're looking at that camera. I didn't want to look at you because. I'm thinking, well, my eyes are going to be focused over there, and I wanted to talk to whoever was watching. It, watching. Yeah. So I was trying yeah. to talk to that, and that, that kind of gets job. you. you You're thinking, job. okay, what do I want to say next? I took, I took swimming lessons at that very pool. Yep. Well, I think it's the same, literally the same she pool. Can get them to you. No, <laughs> do you know what? Oh, Jackie and I went back by there, and she said, you know, they've got a new pool. I said, no. Oh, really? They've got a brand new building that you go in, and I said, oh. so they tore it, they tore up, remember it was the two pools and the uh -huh. kiddie pool? Yeah, yeah. They tore all of that up, and now it's one big pool. Oh. It's really nice. Well, it's like the schools, you know, Paula, you know, Paula Kay, uh, used to be Davidson Cass, she still, te she teaches oh. there in junior high. She oh, goodness. Math. But it's a different building. Yep. Well, like, part of that building's the same. Uh, part of the junior, the junior high, high? Still, and I think she said she teaches in one of the rooms that we used to have classes. Oh, wow. Well. That's a yeah, we drove by the school today, and, and she was trying to point out, now this is the new gym, and, and I said, so this is still the junior high, you know, that section over there? And she uh, said, I think so. I'm 45, we need to go get a freshman. Oh, I got it. Go get one. Of course, I'm Ronnie Edwards. Um, 
After graduation, I went first to uh, Solrath State University at Alpine. Uh, I got a degree in uh, biology, and uh, then after I graduated, I stayed there a year and worked on a master's. And then I went to Texas A&M and, and, uh, in, into veterinary school, and I graduated from Texas A&M in 1977. And since that time, uh, I worked as a veterinarian, so 40 years. Um, the last, since 1979, I was two years in Edinburgh, Texas, uh, with a Dr. Baker there in Edinburgh. And then since that time, I've owned my own business and worked on horses since that time. Uh, exclusively horses. Uh, do a lot of breeding work. Uh, have several big farms I take care of too. Uh, and uh, I have one daughter uh, and two grandchildren. And uh, they live there in Waco. She's got a, they've got her, she and her husband have a home remodeling business. And uh, I'm married to my wife of this one, three years uh, coming up. So she's got some grandchildren too, and we're building a place there in Waco. Uh, we've got a little farm between the little town of Mount Calm and Prairie Hill. And uh, she rides English, and I ride Western, and we still do trail rides and that sort of thing with the horses. Real proud of the place we're building, and so it's been a really good life. Had, had a had a good time. Do you know this lady that just walked in? That's my wife, All Susan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Get over so we can get you in the picture. Yeah, yeah. Here's trouble. Double Here's trouble. trouble. <laughs> all right. Yeah, he was just telling. I didn't know you were a veterinarian. That's all right. Yeah. So you've been doing that for what? Forty years. Forty years. Wow. Yep. And uh, does she help you? You work? Yes. She's a research psychologist, so uh, she keeps me sane most of the time. It's a very good Do you psychoanalyze it periodically? All the time, 24-7. Uh, he was the first real challenge I met in my career. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in this area? Or? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not a Texan. I'm from uh, Connecticut. Ronnie, what happened? <laughs> But you I got wandered here. into the state. Got here. <laughs> yeah, I got here eventually. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, now, where do y'all live? Do you Waco. It's Waco? out of Waco. It's a little town called Mount Calm. Oh. About 300 people. That's out the country, and we live a couple of miles from that little town on, on a 75-acre farm. Do you or, still live in there and work? I yes, mean, sir. I think you mentioned that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Probably right. going to retire in the next three or four years, but uh, still, still doing it full time. As long as you're busy and happy and healthy, I, I just seem like that's the thing. That yeah, you know. it keeps me hopping. Well, you said you, uh, your, your, one of your kids had a store in Waco or something, a remodeling business yeah, or something? Yeah, they do, they do home remodeling for several different customers. One, one guy has a bunch of houses and he rents them and so when somebody moves out, they either fix, fix them up, up. re-rent them or he'll, they'll fix them up and he'll flip them, sell them. We see that show on TV, the yeah, fixer uh, upper. Oh, what is it? Uh, <laughs> fixer upper. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. What games? Chip and Joanna games. Yeah, yeah. That that, uh, that thing is taking off like yeah, that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's something. Uh, it's kind of got Waco. Yeah, the old, on the map. Uh, yeah, yeah, on a really on a big time show. Map. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, they're good people. Seem like they are. I've I've heard a lot of good stories. About right. Them. Well, that's good. So now your 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 kids, uh, you you have, you have just have the one dog. And then uh -huh. where does she? She and she lives there in Waco. Okay. They got a, they got a place well in a little town right outside. Of Waco. Is she the one that has remodeling? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. she and her husband. Uh -huh. Slow on following yep. these things. And so we got a granddaughter that's uh, fifteen. Or she's sixteen. Sixteen. Fifteen. Fifteen. 15. And the grandson's four. So. And your kids? Are they? I have I have kids scattered from Cape Cod to Colorado to California. <laughs> Do you work at school there? And uh, you're a research so, psychology? Yeah. Do you work I, in I college? Have a, Warriors, a, a little place called the Warriors Research Institute that I'm the director of, and I study veterans and firefighters. Oh, wow. She works for Baylor Scott and Latin. It's part of, okay, I wonder if it's part of the college, it's part of the, uh, part of the medical center. Well, I'm a Texas A&M faculty. And then, yeah, and she's on the Texas A&M faculty, too, in the medical school, in the, in the psychiatric department, so, yeah. Well, cool. I've done some work for psychology's office and I always wonder if they're analyzing me or if they're thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, when 
we walk out of our office, we're done with Flip all the that. Flip the switch, huh? Flip the switch, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not, well good. Anything else you think of, right? That's sure good to see you, huh? No, it's good to see everybody. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, hopefully we'll be here for the 60th. <laughs> that's right. That's, it, I don't know when we was kids, it didn't seem like the 20th reunion was even possible. That's now right. we're double plus on that. And that's that's right. right. Still counting. That's right. Oh, that's right. That's right. Well, good. Well, thank right. you very much. It's sure right. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Who else is out there, right? You know? Howard 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 next, Howard? next victim. Right? Next victim. Yes, ma'am. Let's see if she's still out here. Well, I'm, I'm Howard Nolan, and I, I worked in oil field and grilling rigs for the first year out of high school. And I tried to go to college a little bit, run out of money, went back to the drilling rigs, worked on drilling rigs for years so, and got married at age 20. Marriage didn't work out, got divorced five years later. Went overseas, worked for Parker Drilling Company in Kuwait for about two and a half years. Came back, went to work for a service company in Oklahoma, transferred to, to Corpus Christi, Texas, worked for a service company. Oil field fell on its hiney. <laughs> and, uh, went to driving a truck, moved to Oklahoma, back to Oklahoma. Drove a truck up there and worked on some drilling rigs some. And then ended up back in West Texas working on drilling rigs as certain as supervisor. Started out at ground level and ended up as a supervisor. And that's pretty much the way my life went. Do you live in, where do you live now? And now I live in El Reno, Oklahoma. And I, oh, I, remarried after that divorce when I come back from overseas and I've been married to, to Sue for for 40 years. And so you live in where in El Reno? So I live in El Reno, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. So you're oh. and Sue was from Cheyenne, Oklahoma. So she's not too far from home, I guess. Oh good, yeah. Do you family do you have any kids? I don't have any children. Your folks still living? My father both died at early ages. My father died at 70 and my mother at 64. There you go. Oh, yeah. Well, good. Well, uh, anything else you can think of? My three brothers are still alive. I have three brothers. They're all still relatively healthy for their age. Where do they live? Uh, one of them lives in the arena with me, my oldest brother. My next oldest brother, Mike, he lives in Denver, Colorado. He's been up there ever since he uh, got out of the Air Force. And Thurman Nolan is living in Midland, Texas. Thurman's a little older, isn't he? He's my youngest brother. Is he your right? Well, okay. Well, how old is he? I mean, when did he's he graduate? He's a year younger. He's probably 67. So he graduated in 68? He graduated in 60, 68. See, okay. I was thinking he was older. So yeah, he's older than us. But, uh, mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, thank you. Anything else? Like I say, anything else you think of? I don't think of anything really important. <laughs> well, good. Well, Thurman. Uh, 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 I mostly just worked and Work and come home. Not much sports or anything. <laughs> well, sometimes that's all they do. Just keep going and have a good time. We all, we all enjoy kind of living together and growing up in a little town. And it was a that's right. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll get all this stuff here. I'm Gene Calvin. Uh, born and raised in Crane. Went through all 12 years of school there. After graduation. Uh, Worked for Debbie McFarland's uncle in the summertime before going to Saul Ross for college. Went to Saul Ross and spent a year there and Debbie and I were still dating so I was driving back and forth to Crane quite a bit to pick her up on dates on the weekends. And uh, the next year when she graduated she came to Alpine also and we dated for another half semester and uh, another year. And in that summer, we got married, which was the best thing I ever did in my life. I was marrying Debbie. She's been a wonderful wife and great mother and wonderful, we call her Mimi, with her, her grandsons. And so that was my claim to fame was being able to marry her. <laughs> but uh, we finished college there in Alpine. I crammed a four-year education into five. Actually, my Senior year, I decided to get a teaching certificate, so I had to go back for one extra semester to do the requirements to teach. And uh, we did eventually move back to Crane, and we had bought a trailer house to live in while we were in Alpine. We moved the trailer back to Crane, and 
when I was in high school, I'd always, my dad had some property there in Crane, and I was always after him to allow me to build a trailer park when I was there in high school, and he never would, and so when I came home from college, he said that if that's what I wanted to do, that we would do that, so he and he drew it up, he was the architect, and Debbie and I were the workers, and so we put in the little trailer park there in Crane, we still have it today, and uh, that was one of our deals. I worked at a few different jobs. Uh, I worked for Southwestern Bell Telephone for a little while. I sold real estate. My dad was a real estate agent, and I got my license under him. And I sold real estate. We did some ranch property real estate, he and I together. I went to work for a company called Panderay Village, and we were taking clients from Midland and Odessa area to Las Vegas, New Mexico, not Nevada and there was a piece of property up there and we would haul them up there and it was one of those deals once you got them up there you were supposed to high pressure them in and not let them out till they signed some kind of contract and after about I don't know a month or so of doing that I wasn't enjoying that at all I didn't like I didn't mind taking people up there and letting them look but I didn't like high pressure and so I got out of that pretty quick but the whole time we were doing this I was uh, helping my dad at the ranch and working yes. for him, under him, with him. And years later after he had passed away, I was so grateful for the time that I got to spend with him, even though at times it's hard to work for your dad. <laughs> but uh, It's a blessing to be around though, isn't it? Yes, it was. I, uh, after he was gone, I was very, th very thankful that I got to do that. I know for years afterwards, I'd think, well, I'm gonna ask daddy about that, but and I'd think, well, no, I'm not, so. But anyway, I enjoyed that time, and then my mama, we, I got real close to her after Daddy was gone. We were still there in the same town. And my dad had an insurance agency, and <clears throat> in his will, he left the insurance agency to my sister and the ranch to me, and that's kind of how we split things up. And my sister was living off somewhere else, so I ran the insurance agency for her for two and a half years, I think. Got my insurance license, and but it just wasn't for me. I didn't like being in the office all the time. I preferred being at the ranch, so. Uh, eventually had a very nice offer from another competing insurance agency there in Crane to sell, and I recommended that she do that, and she did, and so that got me out of that situation where I didn't have to do that anymore. And uh, then just became full-time ranching, and I don't remember the exact year, but uh, we had the opportunity to buy the old Sand Hills Lumber Company there in Crane, Debbie and I did. And with my degree in Saw Ross being in industrial arts, I thought, well, that'd be a good way to put that to work is that we can buy that lumber yard and I'll be able to use my degree in doing different things at the lumber yard. And we read, it expanded the lumber yard into a feed store also, and so we had Sand Hills Lumber and Feed Store for 15 years and did that. Had a very nice offer to buy us out, and so we decided that we had had a good time at it, we had fun at it, but uh, with that type of offer, we thought it would be best to sell. So we, we're going to have to move to another room. They're fixing to have a science school class. Oh, okay. I just don't let's let's continue on. I just sorry about that. They uh, I didn't know when they were going to start. I thought okay. they, were longer, but they need to get in here. We'll just move down the way here. All right. Let me hang on just a second before we turn it off. Just a second. Okay. Okay, we were at the Sand Hills Lumber Company. Okay. In fact, I had an apron. I intended to bring that from Sand Hills Lumber Company. I still use it. Oh, really? That's great. Oh, good. I'm sorry. Uh, we finished up with that business and Debbie went to work as the DPS secretary there in Crane and a, a couple of years after that I was appointed to the city judge ship there which was just a part-time deal and uh, still ranching and uh, we stayed in both of those capacities for about 10 years and then uh, both retired. We had uh, one daughter that had moved back home with three young children, and so we thought we could uh, help her out. So she 
lived with us for a few years, and that's uh, one reason that we retired from the things that we were doing was to help her out, and we really enjoyed having those grandkids that close. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. And uh, since then, that time, that's pretty much what we've been doing is we still have always maintained the ranch and up until four years ago we were running quite a few cattle. We had about 350 head of mama cows and so it, uh, Debbie and I were doing it by ourselves and would occasionally hire outside help for uh, when we were working the cattle but uh, everyday operations we were doing by, by ourselves and the drought hit us and so we got to the point where we we had sold down to about half and then it continued and so we eventually sold out all the cattle and we're out of the business of raising cattle for three or four years. Still had some nice income coming out of the ranch from different things that were going on down there. But uh, enjoyed that time that we weren't doing anything but just couldn't hardly stay out of the cow business so this year we actually went back on a much smaller basis and uh, we've got purchased about 50 mama cows with calves on them and so that's one of the things that we're doing now. And just finished our 50th high school reunion <laughs> and had a great time and we appreciate Bobby coming and doing this for us. It's oh, been great. It's, it's, a, it's a blessing. But how are you related to, when I was in, where I lived there on Catherine Street, the uh, Billy Tom Cowden and Frida Cowden lived next door. Yes. Uh, were y'all? Yes, cameras? Billy, Tom, and my dad are first cousins, which I think makes Candy and three and me second cousins, if I you figure that out correctly. I'm not sure, but anyway, yes, we were we're related. Sure, sure we just, are. And Candy's still ranching that ranch that, and it joins up. Well, it doesn't. There's a little bit of country in between us, but she's still on that ranch and still running cows on it and we run into Candy quite often. She's quite a gal and we enjoy our friendship with her, which is one of Billy Tom's daughters. Oh, I remember Candy and Tree. They were, they were a little younger. Well, no, they're about the same age because I think when I was in first, second grade, Candy was in first. Yeah, Tree's Candy, little, Candy's a little younger and Tree's a little older than I am and Tree has passed away so it's just Candy now. Tell her hello. She may not remember me, but I most surely will. That was that was a yeah, we used to go work at her house and uh, my daughters say about Candy that she's the hardest hugging woman that they know. Really? <laughs> yeah, I said oh, wow. when she, when she hugs you you know you've been hugged. <laughs> but she's done ranch work all her life and so she's I didn't uh, know that. The other day we ran into her at the Dairy Queen uh, for lunch there in Crane. I almost didn't recognize her. She was in motorcycle gear. Oh. And I said, what on earth are you doing? And she said, well, I'm a member of a Christian motorcycle uh, group over in Midland, and we ride motorcycles. And she's on a big old Harley. And she said that they were prepping to get ready to go to Sturgis, and I, oh, which is oh, up oh, where yeah. North Dakota, South yeah. Dakota, somewhere off up there, like big gathering of motorcycle people. And I, I can't believe you're doing that. She said, well, I enjoy it. And I said, well, I guess you're going to haul that motorcycle up there and then ride around. She said, I am not. I'm going to ride that motorcycle up there. <laughs> and I guess she did. I, I don't know. What? My son was president of the Christian Motorcycle Association in our area. Oh, they wow. They had rides all over the place. And, and I did not, I, I had lost total contact with Candy and yeah. Bree. And, and so the mom and Freda passed away. Uh, my, Tr Billy Tom and Freda both. Yeah, Billy Tom uh, sometime before Freda, but recently within the last five years Frida has passed away and then after that Tari passed away so oh, 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 it's with Candy. does she have a kid or candy no now she has some um, kids that she calls hers but yeah. they're not hers yeah. but, but she's close to some oh, yeah. well, that's not, well i didn't mean to go off on another no, I, I just that's was quite curious right. about that it's a big family and there's interesting stories throughout the family oh, yeah. Bill Tom, there's a lot of stories about him. Oh, yeah, even as a kid, I knew he was a character. He yeah. had a, uh, it was either a Corvette or a Thunderbird. Corvette. Corvette, yeah. yeah. He was a Corvette man. He had a, it was the first one I'd ever seen. You know, yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. And I was enamored with it. And, I, you know, he'd take me for a ride, and I was just 
thought that was a cat's meow. And oh, yeah. One night when he had a little bit too much to drink, he told me, he said, well, Gene, he said, if you won't drink till you're 21 years old, I'll buy you a brand spanking new Corvette. Well, at my age and that time, I just, man, I said, now that is something, you know. And I don't know that that had a lot to do with it, but it did not drink till I was over 21 years old. Uh -huh. And of course, he didn't, I probably didn't remember it after that night, you know, and he didn't know that he probably <laughs> kept me from drinking all of that time, but uh, it, uh, and I wasn't that disappointed. My mother and daddy had bought me a very nice automobile when I was a senior in high school, and so I wasn't, you know, that <laughs> upset about it. But, Morning of my 21st birthday, I kind of thought, I wonder if I'll get a call from Bill Tom today. <laughs> Did not, so. <laughs> it's one the, of the funny stories about him. They were always real nice. To, yes, to they were. And nice. I've got some pictures of, it's either Candy or Tari, I can't remember which, and Frida is showing them, helping them learn to ride a bicycle. Oh. And so they're riding out in front of our house, and we had the, uh, their house and our yeah, house and the spells right. always sleeping at the sidewalk. You're right. And she's got uh, their coattail. There's hanging. She's holding them up by the hanging, grabbing the coattail and holding the kids up because there's a little bitty thing to help her run. And she's running along beside of them. Oh wow! <laughs> and another, they had this little motorized. I'm not uh, in this little car. Had a little gasoline engine in it. Yes. And Kenny Tree would ride back and forth up there. I've got, my mom took some pictures of that. Speaking of your mom, I have to tell you a story about her. She was my teacher, and so at that point in my life, I guess I was kind of a perfectionist. You wouldn't believe it today, but anyway, we were doing our letters and our numbers and stuff and learning how to write those. And about four or five years ago, I got a letter from your mom and I was so surprised to get it and I opened it and I read it and in there she had enclosed some of my papers that I had done in her class of drawing my letters and my numbers and she told me she used those as an example the whole time she was teaching of how you were supposed to do your numbers and letters and I was just shocked and that's such a great memory for me now and I keep that as a memento. I remember that, she, I remember when uh, she, it's been a while back when yes. she's been gone, but uh, uh, I think, in fact, I think that that was something that she sent with us to one of the other reunions. Oh, it could have been. I remember, but anyway, I remember she pulled that stuff out and I had been, well, it would have had to have been 50, 40 or 50 years Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She had uh, she taught Gary Gaines. She had some of his. So there was different, and she talked to her sister. I think. Yes, I think so. Because uh, she had kept this little. I, it was just amazing, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm so thankful she can't see my handwriting today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! She, she thought she did a good job with me. <laughs> well, she uh, she uh, she loved. I have never met a person that loved to teach more than my mom. Oh, she wow. may not have been the most, the best in the world to me she was. I mean, oh, as far as teaching, she picked cotton and waited tables and put her sister through college and then she put herself through college. Oh, wow. And um, went through two depressions. They lost their home, everything, you know, back in the 20s mm -hmm. or whatever it was, because she's born in 1908. And, uh, well, I remember, I, you know, she loved the kids and we loved her. You know, and I wanted to do everything just perfect for her. You know? I, 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 tell, I told somebody, if I got down to the end of a page and I had to erase something, I just wad that one up. Start over? Away and I'd start back over at the top <laughs> oh until God. everything was perfect so I could wow. turn it into her. Well, that was I wanted something. to please her, and, and I well, apparently I did. Yeah, so. oh, you did, you did. Yeah. Yeah, that, did you do the deal? She used to have a, a little jar of uh, milk. Uh, unpasteurized and, and each of the kids is shaking until it turned into butter. Do you oh, really? That? She, she may have started after you, but I remember she she showed our girls that. Our girls have done that for their kids. Take a you know a, a, a mason jar of, of unpasteurized milk, you know, mm -hmm. and she figured out this is like 30 something kids in the class. Each one of them could shake it four times or whatever. So by the time it went all the way around, it was butter. Oh, really? No, I that don't remember. She loved to do that. It's yeah. probably after she's your, your class, so. but uh, 
That was that was one of the things. But you know, speaking of milk, as a kid, I lived. We lived at the ranch till I was six years old, and mother always had a milk cow, and so we drank fresh milk. You know, that's just what we had. And then we moved into town and didn't have a milk cow, and it was quite a transition <laughs> to learn to drink, you know, homogenized <laughs> milk. You know, and it was a different taste. And so I did that all through school that, you know, that I was there. And when I graduated and went to Saul Ross, I had one set of roommates from McCamey and their parents had milk cows. So they would bring fresh milk oh. and put it in the ice box. And it took me a while to change back. <laughs> yeah, I changed back just so I could drink fresh milk again. Yeah, but anyway, when it's cold, there's nothing any yeah. better, you know. Well, thank you for putting all this stuff together. You and another crew that got all this reunion. It's a lot of work sometimes, but it's uh, it's a blessing. Yeah, that, uh, it was. It really was. And as I said, you know, we as a planning committee probably had as much fun <laughs> doing the planning and meeting and visiting uh, as we well, not as much as we had here. But anyway, it was it was a fun time to put all that together. Good. How many people uh, actually wound up being here for the class? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure of the total count. Uh, Pretty good I believe number. that we had 45 that had committed to come, and I think only two. You know, some of them came for Friday night and then couldn't make yeah. Saturday, and so you know, wasn't, we weren't all together all at the same time. Some came Saturday that weren't there Friday night. But uh, I think that there, of all of those that committed, there were only uh, two that did not come. And then we had some that had not committed that did come. So yeah. I was so happy to see Ruth Durrell. I don't believe I had not yeah. seen her since uh, since graduation. Well, that's another question. And she lives wondering. here in, in Odessa, right? Oh, really? Yeah. Well, there's. Uh, I was wondering if there were some that had not, you know, y'all hadn't seen, seen since, since high school. Time, yeah. Well, she was one for me. Now she said she had made a couple of the all school reunions, but I just don't remember. Yeah. I haven't seen her there, so that's oh, well, that's a good it was, turnout. It was so. fun to get to see her and visit with her, yeah. It was a good turnout, you know. It was. Oh, uh, and to get to see the you know, spouses and you know, hear some of these stories. Oh, yeah. It's really been an interesting thing to me. I, I love our class because there is such a camaraderie of, amongst us, you know. We're, we were, for the most part, all friends in high school and we're still friends today. Well, I saw that picture, I took a fact of the pictures last night of the group that had gone through all 12 grades together. And that yes. was, see, in our class, there was over half the class had gone through all 12 grades together. It looked like about the same. Well, there were 16 of us there last night, and we were commenting this morning about several of them that were unable to attend, but were still went through 12 years of, uh, of yeah, school yeah. with us, you know. There, so there were probably at least five or six more that would have been added to that group had they been here. Probably about, probably about half again. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, that's pretty amazing because, my goodness, in the big schools, you know, with the Dallas schools up there, there's, there's thousands. I doubt that 10% yeah. go through any of the grades. You know, and Sue so Asher was talking, she brought up something that I hadn't even thought about that a majority, maybe not a majority, but a large section of the class were kids that their parents worked in for oil companies, you know. And that was a job that you only oh, yeah. moved around quite a bit in, you know, and for that many of them to have stayed in Crane yeah. for 12 years, that, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, and back in our growing up years, it wasn't unusual for a person to work for the same oil company for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, maybe having to get transferred, but still, right. I don't have to. <laughs> now, De Debbie's dad, Hello, McFarland, he worked for Gulf for 40 years. Yeah. You know, he often said Gulf stood, stood for going till life fails. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife's dad worked for Gulf for 43 years. He retired there in Crane. Yeah. And, uh, that's something. I think important. Leonard had uh, moved on up the ladder a little bit and was in the Midland office when he finally retired. But, yeah. Well. Yeah. Many, many years with them. Yeah, well, and they were a good company. They were they good were, they, My dad worked for Gulf for 13 years while he was going to school to get his. Well, I spent most of my growing up years at Sutter Ross. Yeah. That's where mom got her master's. And then uh, she got her bachelor's at, at, at uh, Denton. It used to be North Texas Normal College. Oh. <laughs> it, was t t it was a college for teachers. They call it a normal college. Right. But it, that it became North Texas State College, and now of course University. But and our girls graduated from there. But 
Mom and Greg got her bachelor's there, and then her master's from Soros, and Dad got both his degrees from Soros. I used to tell everybody when we, Art and I, were roommates there the first year, and when we went there, we were going to Soros State College. When we graduated, we graduated from Soros State University. Yeah. <laughs> they had changed Did the that name. Change that time? <laughs> yeah. I wondered when that was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, and I still have things that have Soros College on them, and I have things that say Soros State University on them. Oh, I've got some the little doggy thing with SR on it. Yeah. We'll stay in the Rick Cottages up there, and I climb oh. SR Mountain hundreds of times. Yeah. And uh, yeah, senior, I mean, freshman orientation included climbing that mountain and painting that, whitewashing, and whitewashing that SR bar SR bike. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a pretty good deal. Yeah. Well, anything else you think of? No, I can't. Uh, I appreciate you doing this. Oh, it's. Well, you get to see it on TMZ later today. Wow, or I'll watch it. CNN or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, where are you going? Where are yeah. you going? Oh, good, good, good. All right. All right. Gee, thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you. Do good, Brenda. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just uh, tell us your name and start talking. Okay. I am Brenda Reeves Norman. I, of course, am part of the graduating 1967 class. And first thing I want to say is thank you to Donna Vanderveer. I just can't say enough thanks to her because uh, she's the one that did all of the decorating and she's not even a member of our class. So I just thank her so much. I went through all 12 years of school at Crane. I was one of those. When we graduated, I immediately started Odessa College that summer and went for 27 straight months at Odessa College because I got my registry in medical technology, which meant I supposedly was qualified to set up a lab in a hospital. But I just worked there at the hospital in Odessa some, and then I got uh, I got married before I graduated from OC, and I just didn't like working. I didn't like working in a lab because I never got used to having to stick people. I just did not like to hurt them. So I didn't work very long there. I did go back and work some in Andrews at the hospital there, but it was the same issue. I just didn't like sticking people, so that was my last foray into that adventure. I didn't work while the kids were little. I was very fortunate. My husband worked for the telephone company and made enough money to where I did not have to work and I certainly enjoyed not having to work. But then when the kids got a little older, I did work. I worked for an alarm company and a computer company. Then uh, I started working for an oil and gas company. Actually, I started in Odessa. It was at uh, what used to be El Paso Products, and it veered off into El Paso Hydrocarbons, and El Paso Hydrocarbons is where I worked. Then Meridian Oil bought it, so I went to work in Midland and worked there for 15 years. Burlington Resources bought out Meridian Oil. I enjoyed that work very, very much because I ended up working in the human resources department and I really liked that because it was dealing with people. I worked there for 15 years driving back and forth, then was off work for just a short while and uh, got the opportunity to work a short two week stint with the old Midland Police Department which turned into a four month job and I finally told him I was just so tired of driving back and forth so uh, I quit there have not worked full time since thank goodness I did work for two oil shows in the office there and really enjoyed working for the oil show but now I am just in civic and social clubs I'm in about six different organizations and this year I'm helping a couple of people with their campaigns for public office. I have two kids, they live in Frisco, I go there every once in a while, but I hate to drive so I just fly. And I just plan on continuing doing what I'm doing right now. And it was so much fun having this reunion, getting to see people that maybe you haven't seen in a long, long time, 
And I like the fact that now that we're older, the differences that we had back in high school that made us in one group, separated from other groups, even though it, it, we were in a, you know, a small town, there were still, I thought I knew everybody in my class, but now I go back and look and I'll say, oh my gosh, you know, I really didn't know them. But it's so nice to meet with the people now because now we are just all on the same level. And that's what makes these reunions so nice and so memorable is because we all just are more on the same level and that's something I just really love. And for those of you who were not able to make the reunion, I'm really sorry because we just had a great time. And I do hope that the next one that you will be able to meet, you will really enjoy it. It is nice to get to meet with people, you know, talk to folks that you didn't really spend that much time talking to at school and sit down and do it. It's just, why didn't we talk more? <laughs> right, and you know, you may not have had that much in common with them back at that time, but like I say now, it's, it's just more like we're on a level playing field. And the things that are important to us are important to the other person mm -hmm. now. Wow. And I just think that's, that's what makes our relationships so real now. Now do you live, where do you live now? I live here in Odessa. In Odessa okay. I hope when I graduated high school and I started going to OC, I stayed in the dorm for one semester and then was able to get an apartment. And then a couple of months before I graduated, I got married. I'm still married to the same guy, which you know is like totally amazing. Now we live in the same house that we've lived in for 46 years. Oh, wow. So I don't know what will happen when we ever move. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. That's all right. Well, um, it was nice to get you. You did a lot putting all this stuff together, and it's really a blessing to everybody. But I think people. Some people just won't come, you know, no matter what. And, and uh, we've had situations where in the reading of Delhi, people that come for hundreds, if not thousands of miles to this thing, people in the same town wouldn't even drive across the street. And you never know why, but there's reasons, I guess. But I think they're the ones that miss out because it's, you know, I don't realize some people can't, physically can't, you know, travel anymore. But to me, it's a, it's just a good time. I'm, I'm not even in this class, but I knew everybody, you know, mm -hmm. all I was, four or five years either side of the same class, we all were still friends. Uh -huh. It's just like a family reunion. Yeah, well, you know, Bobby, there are some people I know that live here in Odessa that said they didn't really like anybody back in high school and, and nobody talked to them back then, so why should they come now? Yeah. But I really think if they would okay. come now, they would make some new friendships. They'd, they'd be pleasantly Surprise, yes, and, and I so enjoyed getting to meet some of the spouses that I had not met before, and I feel like I've made some new friendships yeah. with them. Yeah, I, I think your first statement there about uh, you know if they would just come, uh, because I've been to several of these reunions, and not a single one has there been anybody that was an outcast. You know, there's been. You know, there's, there's not been anybody that nobody would talk to. You know? right. they, they they welcome them. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And some of the popular guys over here and gals would hug next with the people that were not considered, uh, you know, the the popular in the crowd, and vice versa. You know, it just uh, but that's just the way it is. I guess. Yeah, but you know? like I say, I think now we realize the things that are really important, and we realize that those are common things to each other. Yeah. yeah. We got, well, Train's been a good place for everybody to live, I think. And, and, um, was, did, did, were you born, in, you, you went through all 12 grades, did, were you all, were you living in Crane when you were born, your family, or? I was born in Seminole, and when I was 11 months old, yep. I moved to Crane. Uh -huh. Yeah, and lived in the same house all through those years and mom and dad lived in it until they were no able no longer able to live by themselves i see pictures of you in the band and i had, uh, uh when i was going through the school annual and I <laughs> yeah i spent uh, the first two years of high school in the band and then i decided that i wanted to concentrate more on just academics mm -hmm. and so uh 
at that time you had to either take band, choir, or PE. And I just didn't want to engage in any of those. And so I had to go through kind of an ordeal with the principal to get him to allow me to drop out of those. Right. Well, I remember in the middle school you were in the band, weren't you? Because I remember that you, were in, you were in the band in middle school, weren't you? In junior mm -hmm. high? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, in did fact. Did you start I, in fifth? I was a twirler yeah, I remember in the eighth grade. Oh, yeah, I remember <laughs> seeing your pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought you were so pretty. Oh, the, thank uh, you. Uh, and uh, I didn't know when you, when you, so you went through freshman and sophomore in high school in the band. Uh -huh. Yes, and I see I played a baritone. And yeah. I wasn't that big. And that baritone was big. That baritone was big. I, I remember one time when I came into Pop McLean's uh, biology class because we had, oh, yeah. I had it right after band. And, and I would just be, oh my gosh, you know, half de dead. And at the end of the year, you know, he told me, he said, I didn't know whether you were going to make it through that year or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember Papa playing in biology. Yes. Was, uh... You know, and it was, it was our grade level that started the pilot year. I don't even remember what they called it, but in eighth grade, we could take some <coughs> of the freshman courses. So we, we like took algebra in the eighth grade and oh. in the general or physical science in the eighth grade so that when we were a freshman we could step on up, you know, to like sophomore level classes. We yeah, were the okay. first class. Yeah, because we followed in. I didn't know where that started, but mm -hmm. I took algebra in uh, uh, eighth grade. And Gosh, I swear now they started in fifth grade. Oh yeah, when you graduate college now, you can have, uh, you can almost be a sophomore in college if you take uh, dual yes, credit we, classes. Our grandkids have done some of yes, that. Yes, there are definitely kids that have graduated from high school with 60 hours of college. Yeah, yeah, they can, I don't know if that's good or bad, I guess it's, I know. it's probably, yeah. it's good academically, but socially sometimes. There's so much pressure on the kids, but anyway, I thank you for allowing us to do this, and uh -huh. I'm sure I'll get to even uh, find out some things about the people that I didn't know, <laughs> so thank you. I oh, you're welcome, it. you're welcome, I, I, I enjoyed it, thank you very much. You bet, and bye-bye to all of y'all. I'm Cindy Edmiston Molesby, and I've had a super wonderful life. Most of it was spinning, well, all of it was spinning crane, actually, until I married in uh, 1969. Married Don Molesby, who was from Nocona, Texas, and my parents were all from Bowie, Texas, which is about 15 miles from Nocona. And I think Don said that his dad and my dad played football against one another when they were in high school. Oh, uh, then we had our first son, our, well, our only son, cut that out, okay? We had our first son, no, we had our only son, yes. Uh, in 1969 and uh, we were never able to have any more but he has been a blessing to us. I went to beauty school when Mark was about two and finished in the required six months um, and then I worked for 35 years and retired in 2008 but we moved around a lot from Odessa. We went to San Angelo, and I worked in San Angelo. And then we went to uh, Iowa Park, and our son graduated from Iowa Park. We moved there between his junior and senior year. Uh, and then we came back to Odessa and bought a house in uh, 1994. Four, I think, or yes, and lived there 12 years before moving again and uh, ended up uh, moving to Florida in 2010 so that we could be with our son and his two children. Uh, Don played a lot of golf and he and Freddie played golf together and we all went to uh, golf tournaments together, Debbie and I, and 
Don and Fred, we went everywhere and had a wonderful time. What else? What now, else? When, when were you in, what years were you in Florida? Okay, we moved to Florida in 2010. And you were there four years? Yes, and we've been, yeah, I've been there seven years. Do yeah. you, you still live, you still live in yes, Florida? Yes, I still yeah. live in Florida, yes. Uh, we sold a lot of, when we moved to Florida, we sold a lot of our uh, belongings, furniture, because we were, before Florida, we went to, uh, you know, it's south of Wichita Falls, a little town, or not even a town, when I lived in the country in this old ranch house, and we were caretakers there for two years. And uh, Don got up and played golf in Bowie every morning and I slept late and then he'd come home and we'd, we'd have lunch and then we'd go pick blueberries and blackberries that just grew wild and pecan trees everywhere and we'd pick up the pecans and uh, his brother had cattle uh, on this ranch and we fed those sometimes. And we just really enjoyed ourselves there. It was just the two of us, and uh, we had a great time. Uh, you and, did you and Sue uh, do some traveling a little bit? Oh, yes. I, and I have been to Sue Asher's house in Georgia, and it's a beautiful place. It's just super, and she is such a busy, busy lady. Oh, you just can't keep up with her. But we've had a great time, and this time since I've been here, we went to Fort Davis, and we were actually gone a week, and we had a wonderful time at Fort Davis, and then from there we went on to Big Ben for a, a day. We started kind of early in the morning, and then got home late that night, but. It was wonderful and it was cool when we got up in the mornings and uh, it's just super. We had a super time. So when... Uh, okay. So now, are, you, are you living in Florida now, right? Yes, I do okay. live in Florida now. Well, that where you plan to stay? Are you going to move somewhere else? Oh, you know no. I, well, I think I'm going to stay there. Uh, I came because my brother the one just older than me, he's 74, and he has Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, which our dad had Alzheimer's. And so uh, I went through all that with him, and he was at the Crane Nursing Home. And uh, then Bill came down with it, and it has gone pretty fast for him, but his wife passed away July the 18th, kind of unexpectedly, she had been ill, but they didn't know what the problem was. And then they found out she had non-alcoholic -cir non cirrhosis of the liver. And she died. I got there on a Tuesday and I took Bill to see her on Wednesday and she passed away that evening. She was not conscious, but we talked to her and hopefully she heard me tell her that I will take care of Bill. Uh -huh. And then his boys decided, uh, well, no, knew, his boys knew that they needed to be, he needed to be closer to them. So they moved him to a nursing home in Cedar Hill. So he has his two boys to look after him and I'll go back through there when I go home and stay with him a couple of days and then I'll fly on home at the end of the month. Well, I love Florida. It's a, and this time of year is the great time to be there. They call this in season from October until about the end of April or 1st of May. And that's when all the northerners come down and they call it being in season. And then at the end of that time, everybody, the Floridians are glad that they're gone. <laughs> they really are. 
Well, I've heard the story. It's a good place. I've, yeah. heard, I've heard it said that, that nobody retires and moves up north. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> they move down south. And I volunteered two, about two years ago. I started volunteering um, for the South Florida Cancer Foundation. And I work in the chemo room. Uh, there's 21 chairs in there, and we just make people feel comfortable. We do anything we can that so the nurses won't have to. We take blood to the lab. Uh, when someone's getting chemo, we just talk to them and ask them if they need a drink or a snack or a magazine or whatever. Some really like to talk to you and some don't want to be bothered. So you just learn to, to do what they want you to. And when uh, the patient is through, then we clean the seat that they've been in and we change the linens on the pillowcases and uh, get it all ready for someone else. Yeah. And, but, and they're everyone nice and they appreciate us and they thank us and the nurses are very kind and are glad that we're there and, and this is the first time I've done volunteer work so I love it and it's helped me to get through uh, and to get through of when my husband passed away he's been gone three years and so I started this two years ago, so uh, it's been really good for me and hopefully good for those that I've tried to help and minister to. Sometimes the helper gets more use out of it than the yes, one being helped. Yes, that's exactly sure. right. Mm -hmm. so, well, now, did your son still live yes. in Florida? Uh -huh. He oh. lives there. Uh, he has a roofing business. Uh, commercial and residential and he stays really busy. Uh, I have uh, two grandchildren, uh, Abby who's 14, this is her first year in high school, and she looks like Mark and I, fair and blue eyes and blonde hair, of course mine was red, but she has a little bit of red in hers, but, and then Merrick looks like his mother who is from Nicaragua, but she moved here when she was nine years old. And she is a citizen, but of course she has dark hair and dark eyes. And, and their son, who's 12, looks like his mom. Yeah. Yeah. And they told me one time, uh, everybody asked us, are we really brother and sister? <laughs> <laughs> and, I tell them, I say, yes, you are, because I was there when you were both born. So, yes, you are brother and sister. Yes, I know it's amazing how siblings can be so different. Mm -hmm. Some can be so much alike, they look like twins, and yeah. some of them can be just same yeah. mom and dad, be totally. Yeah, totally. that's the way Abby and Merrick are, but they're sweet kids, and I just pray that they stay that way. <laughs> Did you have any issues with the hurricanes going through Florida? No. All those things that you missed no, out? No, we didn't. Well, that's good. Uh, it turned west. Harvey turned, it wasn't Harvey, it was... Like Ir Ir was it Irma? I can't Irma, remember. yes. Irma. It turned west. It looked like it was going to go through the center of the state and, and hit both sides. But it turned west and marked, I wasn't there at the time, thankfully. But Mark said it just uh, tree limbs and that sort of thing. Well, wind and rain, but nothing. Mm -hmm. well, that's but good. no problems. Uh, uh, we didn't, and he didn't. But uh, there may have been some. I know there were some without power yeah. for several days. Oh yeah, some of us hit pretty yeah. bad. Yeah, and I yeah, I think my son said he was without power for about a day. So we're very lucky. Very. You want to take more trips with Sue? Well, I don't know, maybe. She loves to travel. Oh, you? she does, and it just amazes me. I wish I could be more like that, but I just never have been. But she just knows so much, and she learns so much doing all of this, and so it's just. 
She was she was my neighbor uh -huh. across yes, the street. I, know. Yeah. And that, and I that. sure remember that. So, and going to Fort Davis, that's so pretty and calm mm -hmm. and cool. And oh, nice. it's peaceful. And we went to the Marfa Lights, Marfa Lights right. one night. And man, there it is super dark because there are no lights anywhere. They don't want any lights on. Yeah. And it just looked like you could pick those stars right yeah. out of the sky. They were so close. They're so brilliant. Uh -huh. and bright. Oh, so yes. And Brenda. Uh, Brenda. Sue knew all of the constellations and she would show me this and show me that and all of the signs. I see that to keep up with all my mind. Did you go to McDonald Observatory? No, okay. we didn't. We were going to because she wanted to go to a star party, but she didn't know that you had to call and make reservations. They only do it on Tuesday and Thursday night. And uh, you had to have reservations, so uh, we didn't get to go yeah. there. Yeah, that's, uh, I remember going there as a child. My folks were in the college there. He saw Ross mm -hmm. and had some yes. kind of deal to go up there. That's a beautiful school, too, yeah. by oh, the way, when you go to Alpine and you see that along that mountain. It's, uh, it's gorgeous. I hadn't been back for years, and Ben and I went by there a few years ago now, four or five years ago, mm -hmm. and it was, I mean, it was. Uh, Pristine looking. She was place. telling us about that. Really? Yeah, it was mm -hmm. just when I was there, it was nice, but it wasn't as manicured and mm -hmm. clean and crisp as it did. Uh, I didn't, at least I didn't remember it that way. Mm -hmm. But when we went back, I mean, the whole the whole oh, yeah. property was just it's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, it was a, that one of my I don't know what why, but my mom and dad had a something in one of their classes, and they had to go to McDonald Observatory. So I went with them. I just a little kid. I got to look through the telescope. Oh wow. <laughs> But that was a yes. When we went back up there, and it was closed. I remember something about a schedule. We just wanted to see it. I just went up there, mm -hmm. and uh, I had some steep climbs to get yeah. up there. I'm probably glad I didn't go. Oh, it, was, it was something else, but uh, it was. Uh, oh, Sue's a good driver. Yeah, <laughs> we had well, fun. She's a, she's a good lady. I she's like a great her. friend. Yes. Anything else you can think of? No. Well, thank you for doing this. It's uh, mm -hmm. interesting to hear hear about people's mm -hmm. lives, and it's uh, nice to get to visit again. It's been mm -hmm. a long time since we sat down and visited. Yes, it has. But I will be glad to see all of this and, and know about everyone and what's going on in their life. I just didn't think mine was <laughs> oh, it's too. Uh, some people have done a lot of stuff, and somehow yeah. they still are loud, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's. Uh, it's just kind of a neat thing to listen to people and you know see what happened because a lot of us there's been some you know that in your classes hadn't been back in touch in 50 years maybe oh, in yeah. touch by oh, mail yeah. or email or something but not uh -huh. actually sit down and talk and since they walked off the stage right it was yeah. wonderful to see bobby steiger i remember him oh yeah yeah uh, did he interview with you no he didn't no there was there was several that did you know and, and some that didn't want to and, and, and he made us not known about it. I don't mm -hmm. know but uh, I, I, uh, I made myself available but I just didn't want to pester people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't you that pestered me. It was all of them in there. <laughs> Brenda and Fred and Jean. And well, it, you know, <laughs> we call it an interview, but as you can tell, it's really not so much. I kind right. of prompt people like I said. Sometimes I'll sit there and think, but you know, but. Uh, it's not like a question and answer. Yeah. I do a lot of interviews because we do. I'm president of the Historic Society in our area, and so we actually mm -hmm. go out and do interviews of, of people, just average citizens or mayors or councilmen mm -hmm. or you know prominent people, and then we kind of have a list of things to go through because we want to learn something about it. But right. but we I quit calling them interviews. I started calling them uh, just conversations because. Mm -hmm. You know, the word interview kind of makes people yeah. think it's a formal question and answer. Yeah, I quite know. Will be a test. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just want to hear about you. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's amazing. I've done a lot of videos of, of people that were used to being in front of the camera and they were well to do folks. And they had, in this case, we, we, we make, I do video stuff too. So they'll have their prompted thing there and they'll do all their stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll have, I just leave the camera rolling because a lot of times you get a lot of neat comments after the yeah. scripted thing. Oh, yes. Finished. And I have seen people once. Once they was finished, they just kind of literally you can see them relax. 
Uh, and they start talking about stuff that, yeah. that's really more interesting, you know. And you're not trying to catch people off guard, but I mean, you know, it's just a lot yeah. of times uh, yeah. things that, uh, more that you'd like to know about, but they're a little timid about putting yeah. them. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Go for it. My name is Larry Vanderbeer, and I, after I graduated from Crane High School in 67, I attended Silver Rock State College for four years. And when I graduated from Silver Rock State College, or Silver Rock State University, uh, we moved to Dallas, Texas. And I lived in Dallas, Texas for one year and uh, realized that living in the big city was not for uh, a small town crane boy. So I called uh, a friend of ours, a friend of the family that worked for Atlantic Creesfield, and I told him I was fixing to leave Dallas. Did he have any job opportunities for me? And he said, well, he said, you know, uh, we're hiring a few people, but he said, I don't like to hire people with degrees because they won't stay. So anyway, he said, if you're, in, if you're bound and determined to move out of the city and move back to Crane, I'll hire you. So I went to come back to Crane and went to work for Atlantic Richfield, and he was right. I was, uh, I didn't stay but 32 years. And uh, upon retiring, I, in, in, in the year 2000, uh, I, uh, I was retired for a, small, a short time before I went back to work for British Petroleum as a uh, consultant slash contractor. And uh, they determined that uh, I need to be on full time with them. So I went back to work full time for BP. And then uh, after BP, Apache Corporation bought uh, BP and I went to work for Apache Corporation, and now I'm working for a company called Navitas that has purchased uh, Apache Corporation. And uh, basically doing the same thing that I've been doing for the last 40 plus years, uh, taking care of their measurement and contractual obligations with third party companies. But in the meantime, uh, Donna and I that married, Donna and I, Donna Pettit, and I married in 1985, and we co-mingled two families. And we have Jason, and Todd, and Tracy, and Corey. And uh, we managed to get all four of them college degrees, and uh, we're, we're very proud of our kiddos. We have, uh, uh, Jason is a, is a captain for Southwest Airline, and Corey is a captain for Southwest Airline, and Todd is a uh, I &E technician for Pioneer uh, Petroleum, and Tracy is a secretary for the principal in Owasso, Oklahoma. And we have 11 grandkids, 11 great grandkids, and uh, so Don and I still live in Crane, Texas. Uh, we've lived at the same place for uh, 30, since 1984, uh, 80, 85, and uh, I'm still working and Donna still taking care of me. <laughs> She's doing a good job. Don't you just do some ranching too? Or do you I, I run some cows. My son, my youngest son and I, uh, he purchased a place in San Saba, Texas, and I go down uh, probably, probably twice a month, and he and I are running some cattle together and uh, some goats, and so we we kind of swap out going down there and, and looking after the cattle and uh, taking care of that. And then I've got a small place in Crane, ten acres, that uh, keeps me pretty occupied, mowing the grass and that sort of thing. Oh my, oh my, in my spare time. In my spare time, yeah, oh my, oh my. <laughs> Something. Well, the, the two boys are pilots, huh? We have, we have two boys that are pilots, and... Uh, That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, uh, 
very proud of all of our kids. Uh, Jason uh, is in management now, so he only flies three days a month. Uh, three days a month, and Corey is classified as uh, chief pilot, so he only flies three days a month. He he's in charge of uh, uh, hiring all the new hires for Southwest Airlines mm -hmm. in the in his district. So we're we're proud of all of our kids. They've all done well. Our grandkids are doing good and involved in every kind of sports and gymnastics and dance and, and everything else. And so one of these days when we slow down long enough to retire, we plan to spend more time with our grandkids and, and hopefully being able to do a little traveling. But uh, you got 11 great grandkids. 11, you know, 11 grandkids. Not great grandkids. Okay, that's just okay, grandkids. I thought you said 11 great grandkids. No, 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 no 11 grandkids. Oh my. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Oh, anyway, we're, we're very blessed. We, we've had a, uh, a very good life. We really have. And uh, Donna and I are very happy. And of course, since Donna and I were both lived in Crane, makes staying in Crane easier for both of us. So. Uh, well, you, you lived in Crane all your life. You want to well, you? my family moved to Crane in uh, uh, 58 from Goldsmith, Texas. Not so too far away then. We, we've, lived, we've lived out in the, in the, in the Permian Basin yeah. my entire life. So you went through all 12 grades to Crane then, didn't you? Oh, yeah. So well, I, no, I moved to Crane in the uh, fourth grade. Oh, okay. Fourth grade. Miss Bryan and Mr. Yeah. Jones and uh, Miss Bryan and Mr. Jones and then in the junior high. You had George Jones? That's uh, George my Jones. fifth grade teacher. I did. Yeah. 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 I know Don and Bonnie were there on. Right. They were both born and raised right there in Crane. So yeah. Been there a long time. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good place. Yeah. Crane's a good place to raise a family. You know, and, and it was a good place to grow up. You know, it was a good place to live when we was growing up. We were pretty fortunate not to be involved in all of the uh, big town activities that goes on. So it, it was good, and it was a good place to raise a family. Yeah. You know, every time they messed up, we usually knew about it before they got home. <laughs> Everybody, oh, you, you couldn't do anything without somebody else seeing the report. And that's that's all right. Man. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but we've had a we've had a good life, a good life, and yeah. and, and still a lot more to come. Yeah. Well, it's good to go back to these get-togethers and reunions. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I thoroughly nice. enjoy it. Um, you know, get to, get to see folks that I haven't seen in a long, in a lot of years. And uh, I think it's important that we get together, you know, uh, and, and, and share our experiences, some bad, some good. Yeah. But uh, it's just... Uh, uh, as as we mature, we realize that friendships are very valuable, yeah. and it's important that we, in my opinion, that we stay in touch and and uh, and communicate. So that's why I enjoy these reunions. You mentioned Sam Savin. Uh, Stan Williamson has some property down there. Do you know Stan? Do you know Stan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. he, I think he's got some ranching property down there somewhere. In that really. Area. Uh, well, this this little place is is actually between San Saba and and Lomita, but it's yeah, pretty country. It's it's hill country yeah. and a uh, lot more water than we got in Crane, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming in from our area, you, see, you know, we I've been gone since I graduated sixty seven, yeah. sixty nine. Sixty nine. Well, most of the time we come back, it's dry and barren, but you know, it's green. It's, it's, it's not bad. I, I have a wheat field in my front yard this year for the first time. <laughs> I planted, we got, uh, uh, we got three inches about uh, three weeks ago. And I got out there and planted a wheat field, or we planted some wheat in my front yard. So mm. I've, got a, I've got a little stand of wheat in my front yard. Uh, but it sounds like it's rained a little more this year than it has. Some, but, uh, it has. It's, uh, it's yeah. But it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, you would come back out here and everything's pretty dry yeah. and barren. Yeah. I know it's come back more to Odessa, everything's kind of green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Larry, thank you. Is there anything else you can think of? I can't think of a thing, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't think of anything else exciting that anybody would be interested in, <laughs> as far as it concerns me. But I do appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. That's a blessing. Tell me. Tell you're, me. You're, no, you're the one that's going to be interviewed. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs>
Oh, I've not told him my whole story. Oh, well, I see. I was born and I'm still here. <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, Larry's class of 67. I'm class of 70. And between, I would say, the 70, 71 class through the 67, maybe 66 class, there were so many people that went together and actually married. We can kind of pick up from where we stopped, but just uh, you were talking about the classes and people. Oh, uh, yes, from uh, class 70, class 67, there were so many of us that went together or uh, were close and got married. and. That's, that's, to me, that's a cool thing. So I married uh, Roger Pettit right out of high school. He passed away. And then after our lives changed, we got back into uh, touch through various crane people that thought we ought to get back in touch. Well, we all dated in school, didn't you, son? No, that yeah. would be Vonna. 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 Vonna's twin sister has dated. Are you Vonna. sure you know who got? Are you sure you got? <laughs> yeah. Oh. She has dated Larry. So, I, but I got the best of both worlds because I got, got yeah, both. Yeah. So, but we've had four kids together and uh, four kids combined and they bleed Vanderveer and Pettit. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That we're just all so close. We've been really blessed. And to get back to Crane, and he's just a work workaholic. And I thought when he called me when I moved back from Florida that he was just a big old teddy bear. He was just so sweet. I loved yeah. him. He was kind and sweet. All the women loved him too. They <laughs> well, thought he was good they, looking. But I including my wife, I must admit. <laughs> I, I got him. <laughs> so we've just been uh, living in Crane for 32 years, I guess, and have 11 grandkids uh, amongst amongst us. So our family is big. Mm -hmm. Big, yeah, big and, family. And uh, he's working. I worked at the uh, various secretarial things and I worked, my last job was at First Baptist as a ministry assistant and that's about the sum total of my life. I quilt, I spend too much money, he says, <laughs> and so he's still working, he says. He mentioned something about that. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sure he did. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> but anyway, it's been a good life. We've been yeah. very, very blessed. Yeah. Very blessed. God has said uh, his blessings on both of our families. Yes. So. Well, now besides Vonna, do you have any other? Yeah, did you have another brother? Oh. Yes, I Dwayne. had. Yes, I had an older sister, Joyce, who okay. went to Crane. She's 14 years older. I had a brother, Lynn Dwayne Parker, uh, and he was 11 years older than Vonna and I. And then our daddy died, and so mother uh, and then mother had us twins. Surprise and with them nearly grown. And so we grew up in a house of just my mother and my older sister, 14 years older, my brother, and he died of ALS in um, 80, uh, 82, 83 or 84, something like that, of ALS. And so uh, we're just kind of all of our parents are gone, oh. and so we're just kind of... I remember your mom. Yeah, yeah. redheaded. She was county treasure uh, yeah. forever, and she was. She uh, she raised us all, all four of us, and, and then finally found somebody in the oil field business, and they got married, and I so I said, that. I told my mother a long time ago, I said, well, I'm married, and I have two kids. Vonna's married and has two kids. And now this is 1978 and you're just getting married? She said, well, you know how it is. <laughs> and so I said, well, we're, we were glad for, for yeah. her that she got remarried and she lived in Crane, passed away about 12 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you very much. And we're still in Crane. And yeah, still that's in good. Crane. We will die in Crane. <laughs> well, it's, uh, Under it's... the oak tree. <laughs> It's a good place. I, yeah. I, I really, uh, I've told everybody this, I, I just love living there. I never did oh, like crying. Oh, I did too. I did you know, too. Some good people couldn't wait to raise a family. It was, was, it was, so, they hit right on it in the devotionals yeah. and Terry's remarks. Uh, it kind of was just a special place. I think I, I think, think yeah I think small town America is good but I think Crane really did have a yeah. it, it special had a special thing I, I don't know why yeah. but it just did 
it, uh, you know, you watch my very, you know, on TV, and it felt like that was our town. Yeah, same with Sh Sheriff Weatherby was Andy Griffith's yeah, artist. Yes, and sometimes a little boss hog, and yeah. <laughs> all of that combined. Yeah. So, but well, that's that's all we know about that's us. That's it. Oh right. well, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, right. thank you. Uh, we kind of did a deal with uh, Gary yesterday. Yes. But you weren't in it, so. Well, I don't need to be. <laughs> well, no. you're a part of it. You, know? uh -huh. you might just, if you don't mind, just kind of reiterate a little bit just your life after after graduation and what you did and then how you where you where you and Sharon met. And, well, we we met and got married before our senior year of college. Okay. Well, when you left Crane, you, where did you where did you go to school? You went to Angelo State. AC, okay. And that's where y'all met. Right. We met in Crane, actually. But did you grow up in Crane too? There. No, my parents moved there after my freshman year in college, and I went. I was going to Howard County, and I finished there as a sophomore. And then we met the next Christmas at Crane, at, kind of at a, after a basketball game. So it was, it's. How many ball games have you been to? <laughs> oh, <okay>. Basketball, <laughs> football, yeah. tennis. A lot, a uh, lot. That's for sure. So y'all, well, when you left Crane, where did you go to school? Went to Angelo State. Angelo State, uh -huh. okay. And then that's when we met. That's where y'all met there, okay. Uh -huh. And then you got into coaching. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, after four years of college, that's where I, where we did. Went well, to Fort Stockton first. Was that where your first uh -huh. coaching job was in yep. Fort Stockton? Mm -hmm. And uh, what were you football or just basically? Football coaching? and basketball like, and track back in those days. Main coach, yeah. Yeah. And then from Fort Stockton, where did you go? Oh my goodness. We went, we were in Monahan, we were at Fort Stockton one year in Monahan, we went to Monahan. Four years. Four years, uh -huh. oh yeah. And then he he got his first head job at Petersburg by Lubbock. Oh, okay. Well, that's, so that's how you got into Lubbock environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. How long were you there at? at uh, we were there two years and then I came back and uh, went to? Denver City. Denver and City. then we went to Permian as an assistant. Yeah. And then you pulled it all. Yeah, I'm not to find out. This is exactly. And then we went to Tascosa for a year, and then we went back to Monahan's as head coach, and then we went to Permian as head coach, and that's where they won state. Mm -hmm. Then he went to Tech with Spike. I remember hearing about all then that. Then he went to uh, in, uh, Evelyn Christian. No. Then he went to Evelyn High. Then he went to San Angelo Central. Then he went to Abilene Christian, head coach at Abilene Christian for five years. Then he was athletic director in Odessa for two years, athletic director in Ooh. Lubbock for two years, and then back to Permian um, for four years. That's and then he yeah. retired. Wow. <laughs> well, now you taught school during most of that time, didn't I you? I taught school. I was in education for 38 years. Uh -huh. I did some other things at the end, but yeah, so I taught wherever we were, I taught. Well, that's uh, well the claim to fame course is the Permian deal, you know, I mean, that's what everybody hears about in our area. We, we see the movie, you know, mm -hmm. and things, and we talk about how the, I'm the Dallas area. <laughs> Football is big up there, mm -hmm. but ain't nothing like out that's here. Right. It's just this is just that's incredible, it. and and that's not bad. It gives the kids out here stuff to do, and they're not in trouble. Exactly. And I tell you what, you've been an inspiration to so many people. Well, I yeah. thank you. Well, literally, you, you have. You know, and, and even I don't know whether the movie is accurate or not, but it's close enough to reality. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, this is not supposed to be my show. I'm just thank, commending you for what all you've done. Well, I've, well, I've heard stories here, you know, about things that you've done, but. Uh, instilling those students, you know, the, the sure. honor and, and mm -hmm. you know, work hard, a good work yeah, ethic. Yeah, exactly. But, um, I have to tell you one, one thing about, and I tell this to a lot of people, you know, he has influenced a lot of athletes, but he also has influenced um, students that nobody else would um, recognize. He would, at Permian, he would wear his suit and coat, his, his coat and his tie and slacks and go down the halls in the morning and greet students that had nobody to make them feel important. And they would come up to me and, Miss Gaines, Miss Gaines, 
-hmm. Coach Gaines talked to me today in class. <laughs> and you know, that to me, it means so much more than the athletes. Because the athletes, um, they have that niche. And these kids don't have niches. And he took the time to make, and that's the kind of man he is. He took the time to, to go down the hall and, and make these kids feel important. And I love that. Okay. Well, that's just like a celebrity, you know, uh, uh, God talking. <laughs> that's true. Well, this is it, before the movie or anything. Well, I mean, with even a coach, though, a head coach in any school is kind of yes. good or bad to put on a pedestal. So. Right. Well, <laughs> and, uh, and for him to do that, I just, that just says what, who he is. Well, it just says who he is. Well, that's not, and I heard uh, Terry was talking last night about him helping get a place for him. Yes. His family was almost yes. all killed. That was incredible. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Who was that? Terry Morris. Have to get a house there and, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, well, every morning before go to see to him. Check him. Check him. Something. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the uh, of course the Permian thing is a is one of the things that people hear, and it's a it's a blessing to know. Say we get claim to fame. We know somebody that the movie well. was made about. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but the, the things that you instill in those kids is really more important. It yes. really is. And that's, that's exactly what it was. It, uh, you know, we had some good, good players. Uh, and the thing that, that is kind of, uh, the thing I like about it is that as years go on, they, they come back, you know, and say, you know, Coach, thank you. And, that, uh, I mean a lot better. Yeah, and to help them, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. Yeah, well, that's a blessing. Well, we're sure glad you're able to be at this, and thank you for taking time <laughs> well, to do this. And thank, I you. thank you, Sharon. This is this uh -huh. is a we'll, we'll have all this stuff together pretty soon. And let me get a good picture of you here, right quick. Okay. I want get. I got a whole bunch of pictures, but. Would you take a picture of me? I don't, I'm not, yes, I'm not in any hurry yeah. pictures. This is yes. all right. I won't get. Hey, let me, let me get my glasses. Oh, I may have left my glasses laying there. Oh, it won't. Okay. Yeah, this is what you, it doesn't yes. show up here. You look through that yes. and push it down halfway and it focuses. Yes, and then, I have one like uh, this. I thought about bringing it, but I didn't. <laughs> one, two, three, See if that makes any look. It's good. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Good. You done good. <laughs> Thanks, You're welcome. Thank, Thank you for coming you. here. Wow. All this. Oh, this is, we appreciate you. This is fun. I'm sure it's good to see you again. I you hope you can, we can do this again before. Yeah, another 50 Thank years. You. Well, <laughs> you know, who was it was saying maybe we could do it in five? Yeah. You know. Who else would be good? That's yeah. all. That's well, good. one of the nice things I like about, you know, they started that ever, what is it, all class reunion every five years. Mm -hmm. They've been doing it for a long time now. That's kind of, that's kind of nice, you know, because sometimes you get to see people, well, like here, you know, there's a few from other years, sure. but we, sure. we knew kids three or four yes. years older and three or four years yeah. behind us, so yeah. that's kind of a neat deal, but, oh yeah, I'm all for, we had our 48th reunion earlier this year. Oh, okay. And then we're scheduling our 50th. I graduated in 69. Okay. And from Crank. Uh -huh. My mom taught him some things. That is so cool. Well, um, uh, we, Gene. the reason we haven't been to those is because he's been coaching. Yeah. You know, and he's always working during this time of year. Oh, yeah, this is a hot season right uh -huh. now, yeah. So, we'll that's why free. maybe we can Go to that one next time. Yeah. I know the all, all crane. Like it's every five years, so it'll be, uh, what's this? This is, that uh, will be three years from now. Oh, okay. So it'll be, uh, that's what I'm assuming they do. They're on that, you know, five uh -huh. again. That's right. cool. Well, I hope we're still there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am too. Before I left high school, Ricky Smith, a fellow classmate, and I joined the Air Force together on the buddy system. And, uh, we ended up, I went a week before Ricky did, but I went to, uh, in the Special Forces, in the Air Force, Special Operations, so I had to lay out for a week to be tested, make sure I could go through the physical stuff and everything. 
I missed enough training I had to go back to the, the flight behind mine and start over with a new group and Ricky was in the group. So we ended oh. up going to basic training together anyway. Oh, and uh, like I say, I was a forward air traffic controller, combat controller in the Air Force. Went through Navy SEAL training for that before I went to my uh, instruction in the Air Force for calling in airstrikes. My main job in Vietnam was not being in Vietnam, was going to Laos and Cambodia when the president said we wasn't there, calling in airstrikes on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They call us the Highway Patrol of the Ho Chi Minh Trail because we, we control the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, we did that. I did that for, I didn't do a full one year tour in Vietnam. Uh, because Nixon got, uh, I guess, nervous because he was telling people that we weren't in Laos and Cambodia and we weren't bombing there and we were, and he was afraid he was going to get caught. So all of a sudden we quit doing missions there and I started doing more missions in Vietnam. And basically we were doing stuff we weren't trained to do. They started sending us to bases that were uh, under attack, basically under siege. Most of them were in remote areas, maybe be marine forward bases and stuff. And they would send us in to call in airstrikes to, to try to alleviate the pressure they were getting from mortar fire and stuff. And that's when I started getting hurt because they were putting us in places where we were in between the enemy and the base and I ended up getting three Purple Hearts real quick. Uh, and uh, the rules were you get three Purple Hearts, you got to get out of the theater of war. But, so I thought I had my free ticket home. I thought I was going to be come back to Grand Texas. <clears throat> and the last wound I got was shrapnel in my chest. Well, they flew me to Japan and did the surgery to take that out. And I thought from Japan I was going home, and then I found out they said, no, you got to go back to Vietnam. And I thought, well, I'll go back to Vietnam, then they'll send me home. And I got back to Vietnam, and they said, no, you just got bed rest for three weeks. And two days later, I was back in the field, because we were short-handed, and I still had a hole in my side. And they said, well, we'll wait, you know, you had to stay out in the field until we get your orders to send you back to the States. Well, I told that old sergeant that was over that that I didn't want to go back to the States yet. Uh, I did, because I figured there'd be two things that was going to either have me train forward combat controllers to replace me back in Florida, which wouldn't have been that bad, or I was going to have to go back to Biloxi, Mississippi and get trained to be a full air traffic controller, and I didn't want to do that, because everybody knows the stress of that. So he said, well, we got something coming up. If you would like to try out for it, would you like to go to Thailand? I said, is there a war there? And they said, no. And I'd already heard, I'd never been to Thailand, but I heard they had good looking women. And, <laughs> and it was a good time. So I said, now I want to try that. So I, I did a stand board and they selected me. And what it was, they were gonna go train special forces in Thailand. They're, they're equivalent to the Green Berets, they were Black Panthers is what they call them. Uh, they wore a Black Beret. So I got to Thailand, they put me up in Bangkok for two days in a hotel, and they loaded us up in a two and a half ton truck to go up north to Camp Friendship where we were going to train the Thai troops. We got to the front gate and they wouldn't let us on the base. And we sit there all day long trying to figure out why they wouldn't let us on the base. The colonel that was in charge of us finally, they let him talk on the phone there at the, the guard shack at the gate, talk to the Thai base commander, and he told me, he said, I don't know why you can't come on base, but I've got orders you can't come on base. So we, he got on the phone, had him to patch it on back into Bangkok to our headquarters, which is just made, it's joint United States Military Advisory Group. See if they could tell them why we couldn't go on base. Well, they didn't know. They said, well, just come back to Bangkok. So 
So we went back to Bangkok, stayed in the hotels for a couple more days until they figured it out, and finally they found out what the problem was. The king of Thailand didn't want American troops to leave Thailand. He didn't want his troops to be too self-sufficient because we were dumping lots of money to their economy. So it was a political thing. And the embassy got involved in everything, and it just, they come down to no, we can't do it. So they said, well, everybody's got to go back to the base that you were at. And I told them, I said, I can't go back. I've got three Purple Hearts. I can't go back to, to Vietnam. So I'm ready to go to Crane, Texas. <coughs> and they said, no, you can't. <laughs> and they said, no. Uh, the soak sergeant said, you really don't want to go back to the United States for duty that bad? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, let me see what I can find. He said, go back to your hotel. And he said, if I come up with something, I'll call you tomorrow. Well, he called me the next day. And he said, how would you like to be a cop? And I said, I don't have any training at all. He said, that's all right. You're in the military. We'll train you. So I ended up working Armed Forces Police in Bangkok. And because of that, but that accident of not being able to do what I was supposed to do, I ended up meeting her. She was a waitress in a, she was a waitress in a coffee shop in a bowling alley. Uh -huh. And uh, took me forever to finally get her to date me. I kept going in there eating lunch, getting better acquainted with her, and finally got a date with her. Most expensive woman I ever dated. Because over there, when you take a girl on a date, you take the family on the date. Oh wow. I went to the picture show and it took two taxi cabs full of people. We all had to take them all to the concession stand once we got in. Was it worth it? Yeah. All right. I, it did. Okay. <laughs> 47 years later, we've been married oh, 47 wow. years. Wow. Uh, the most interesting thing to me about what they liked at the concession stand, you know, we think of Cokes and popcorn and candy. You know what they all wanted to buy? that they sold the concession stand? Del Monte Prunes. <laughs> Buy a box of prunes. That was a delicacy over there, and it cost a dollar a box, and that was like 20 baht over there. That's equivalent like $20 to us. Very expensive thing. So I had to buy like six or seven boxes of prunes for them to eat at the picture show. But uh, that's the first time I'd ever seen prunes sold at a, uh, uh, at a theater. picture show, I too. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, uh, we were in, in uh, I was in Bangkok, and then I got to come back, and I got discharged at Bergstrom, at Austin. And I only had about uh, five and a half weeks left the time I got back to the States. I was supposed to get out. Well, I went, to, I was trying to find an apartment or something to rent for her to come down there with me. Well, at Austin at the time, you had to sign a six-month contract just to get an apartment six month lease, but well, there's no way I could do that. I only been there a few weeks. And uh, so she stayed with my mother and dad. She ruined my dad, spoiled him rotten, and uh, waited on him hand and foot. When I got ready to get out during my separation physical, they found a spot on my left lung. And I had a, a coccygeal mycosis, which is Cox is a short term for it, it's a fungus. And they said probably because of the wound I had in my lung, and I ended up taking the left lower part of my lung out. And they actually gave me a retirement, a medical retirement from the military. That lasted about, how long was it? Four months. I had to go back for a follow up physical. And they said, well, you're only 98% disabled now, you're not 100%, so we can't leave you on the Air Force retirement, get to the VA. So then I went to the VA, and every time I'd go to the VA, they kept cutting me down until I got down to 35%. And I told them I'm not going back to the VA anymore because I was afraid they going to take everything away. I went for 40 years, I guess, before I ever had to go back to the VA again. Yeah. Uh, but after, after I got out of the, the service, I still had a hole in my side from that surgery and hadn't healed up good. Uh, 
I wasn't supposed to work for about five or six months, but she was pregnant, about to have a baby. Uh, and we were living with my parents and I needed to work. So, uh, Jay Cockwood's dad lived across the street from us, Caddy Corner from us. And he owned a Gulf station there in the middle of town and he come over and he asked me, he said, can you work for me? And I said, well, I can't do anything heavy, fix flats and stuff. And he said, well, if you just, he said, I can't find anybody to work. He said, if you just take the money in the office, just take the money. He said, I'll do all the gas pumping, I'll take, fix the flats and everything. So I worked for him for about two weeks. And then Gray Webb come and talked to me and said well, he couldn't find anybody. It was the only job I could get was sacking groceries. Well, groceries. Yeah, so I worked for Gray sacking groceries for about a year. I also worked at the same time, I worked at the police department at night as a dispatcher. In Gray? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I worked 12 hours at Gray Webb store and I, I got off, I worked from 7 in the morning to 7 at night. Had 30 minutes off for lunch. As soon as I get home, she'd have uh, supper ready for me. I'd eat real fast and then I'd take a quick shower and I had to go work at the police department at night. There's a dispatcher and then I also relieved the uh, patrolman if I had somebody on vacation or off or something to ride patrol. It was a city cop. And uh, like I said, I did that for a year. And the VA kept sending me letters because I was a disabled vet wanting me to go to school. Well, I never wanted to go to school, to college. Didn't do good all through high school. I barely graduated. My grades were terrible. I could care less about school. I, I, I just wanted to get out and get going. My dad wanted me to go to college. He'd saved money for me to go to college. And I told him it'd be a waste of my time or a waste of your money. So I did. I saw him going in the service. And Dad and Mother didn't want me to, Vietnam War going, they didn't want me to go in the service. But, uh, um, I'd had a neck injury in football when I was in high school. And they wouldn't let me play football anymore. Mother talked to Dr. Maynard and not signed a release for me to play. I think I could have played. Mother didn't like me playing football, so anyhow, I, the release wasn't signed, so I couldn't play football anymore. Well, Dr. Molinoff was there during that time period. And Dr. Molinoff, I don't know if you'll remember, but he, he was just there for a few years. As soon as he turned 35, he left Crane. He was there because he got a draft deferment. He was kind of anti-war guy. Oh, and he come and told me, he said, Bob, you do not have to go. He said, I can ride up about your neck and you don't have to go. And I said, no, I won't go. And uh, Ricky Smith didn't weigh enough to get in, the guy that went in the buddy system with me. Yeah. And like I say, you know, it showed the x-ray, showed my neck and everything, and I lied. Told him I had no problems. It did still kind of hurt, but I lied and told him it didn't have any problems with it. Ricky didn't weigh enough, but the night before we had to go to Abilene for the physical, we spent the night in a hotel there, and we went down to a grocery store and bought a bunch of bananas. And I made him eat bananas all night and drink water, and we got him to where he weighed exactly enough to get in the Air Force. So, you know, here's two guys who wasn't supposed to be in the Air Force ended up getting in the Air Force. And Ricky got out after four years and then turned around and went back in and ended up doing a career. He did 20 years and retired because of eating bananas. <laughs> Ricky, I think, weighed 90 pounds or 95 or something. He had to weigh like 100 pounds or something to get in. He didn't weigh enough. But we put enough bananas down in the water and he got sick on them, eating some of the bananas. But anyway, I got out of uh, working for Grant. I kept getting letters from the VA. Wanted me to go to school. And I got tired of getting the letters, and I finally I told the guy, I said, well, they want me to go to Lubbock and take some tests. I told the guy, I said, I'll go up there and I'll take their tests. And when they see how dumb I am, they'll quit sending me these letters and they'll leave me alone. So we drove up to Lubbock in the early in the morning, and I took the, the test. And the guy came out and he said, 
you can do anything you want to do. You got some of the highest grades we've ever had. And I said, you are kidding me. You got a mistake somewhere from Huh. I said, I barely, I had terrible grades in high school. In fact, I wouldn't have graduated if Pop McLean hadn't given me a break on my physics. You know, I think he gave me a two point break or something so I could pass to graduate. Oh, wow. and, and I had, Daryl Warren gave me a break on my math. <laughs> you know, but uh, anyhow, all of a sudden I was, he was sitting there talking me going to college and I said, he said, where do you want to go to college? And I'd already bought a house in Crane. UTPB didn't exist then. And I said, well, what does Odessa College got? And he had me a catalog, and I got to looking, and there's stuff in there I didn't, they offered, I didn't even know it was offered. And uh, since I was a kid, I worked for my uncle in the summer in Freer, Texas, in a machine shop and welding shop. And I always did good in that and liked it. Well, they offered welding and machine shop both there. And I told that lady that was handling my case there, that said, oh, that's what I want to take. I want to take welding and machine shop. She said, no, you got to take just one. Pick which one you want. I said, no, I want to take both of them because it kind of goes hand in hand. She said, but you, can't, you can only take one at a time. I said, well, I want to take both. And she said, well, I have to go talk to my boss about it. She went and talked to the supervisor, and his dad used to own a machine shop. And he came in and he said, he's right. It, it does go hand in hand. He said, but that is going to be kind of hard to take a double major. And I said, well, that's what I want to do. And dumbing me, anyway, I thought that you took college classes was like high school. You took one class right after the other from like 8 o'clock in the morning to 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So the first semester had 23 semester hours. <laughs> I thought that's the way you're supposed to do it. And the dean of registration told me then, he said, you're taking pretty heavy load. I don't think it, you need, I think you need to back off. I said, no, I need to, I want to get this over with and this is what I want to do. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll let you do it. But if you get the problem, you come see me and we'll put you out some of these classes before you won't have to. That's Probably pretty good load. Flavor, yeah. So I did, and uh, took that 23 semester hours and had a 4.0 average. And I was running machine shop in grain at the same time in the afternoons. This is what I was telling you. I've had about three lifetimes. I always do three or four things at one time. You don't come home till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I worked like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I had to be at Odessa College at 7 o'clock in the morning for my first class. So I, I didn't hardly get any sleep. I did all my studying. I took a tape recorder and I'd take my lectures and I'd listen to that tape coming and going back and forth between Crane and Odessa. That was my studying mostly. And uh, then I, when I got off of work in the afternoon, I would work there in that machine shop till late at night. Uh, at any rate, I did four years of college in 18 months. And with a 4.0 average, and as soon as I graduated, they hired me to teach machine shop at OC, the youngest professor they ever had. I think I was 23. Um, then I ended up, having, I got my bachelor's degree, and I got my master's degree, and I got my PhD, and all from MIT. You know, when you teach college, they make you keep taking college classes, and I never, I didn't, I intended, I never intended to teach. And when they did, they hired me part time in the summertime when I first went to work. Cool. Awesome. And the guy that was the department chairman, uncle died and left him a machine shop in Lubbock. So he quit and went to Lubbock. And they moved everybody up a notch, so they moved me from part time to full time. And two years later, I was department chairman of the machine shop. And then I created another department. So I had two departments I was chairman of at OC. But anyway, uh, most people know if you, if you teach at the college, you have to keep going to college, to keep taking classes, and they ended up with a PhD. Not ever intended to have one. Uh -huh. A guy never wanted to go to college. <laughs> uh, but I found out quick that in Crane High School, you learn more by accident than a lot of schools learn on purpose. 
because all my college classes in English and math and government was nothing but a review of what I had in grain high school. That's a good teacher there, didn't they? Yes, sir. Trying they were actually hard. teaching us college level. There's no doubt in my mind. And you had the open entry. Yeah, I created, that's why I got my PhD on my thesis was on, I created open, open entry, open exit program, which is now a big deal all over the United States. And a lot of these, uh, I, I get tickled now to see them they're advertising some of these uh, colleges that you can get online and go to school with open entry and open exit. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and the way I come up with that, we had the big boom here in Odessa and they couldn't find enough employees and they needed welders and machinists trained fast. And uh, that's how we created it, where you could come in, a student could come in and take a class, sign up any Monday and start a class. And you could advance as fast as you wanted to go. Had blocks of learning that if they wanted to go for a, uh, one course might be three weeks long, but if they could finish sooner, they could and they could sign up for the next block. So that way, they, some of them could finish up ahead of time if they really wanted to. And we also had a setup where they, we had, uh, each class was five hours long, five hours in the morning, five in the evening. I had a lot of them would take the morning classes and the afternoon classes. That's like a full-time job for them. Yeah, and they could finish it half the time. So they could do a two-year program in one year or faster. I had one student that did it in seven months that he ended up getting my old job. When I retired, he ended up taking over my job. I hired him as a part-time instructor when he first graduated and hired him as a full-time and then he got my job when I retired. But uh, another thing that happened at Odessa College is I had a student that come up to me and he said, uh, we're the OC Rangers, right? And I said, yeah, that's right, we are. And he said, uh, why don't we have a rodeo club? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, what would it take for us to get a, a rodeo club started? And I said, I don't know. He said, could you find out? And dummy me, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll check and see. Well, I went over to the administration office and I asked them and they told me what all, and I don't remember all the qualifications. We had to have so many people sign a petition that they were interested in having it. And, and then if you got enough names on a petition, you had to have fundraisers to, to get things going enough to where you could have officers elected and that kind of stuff and, and have a, a fundraisers for money for them to operate on. So I went back, I told that kid, this is what they said you gotta do. And he said, okay, well he went and did all that stuff. Next thing I know, Phil Spiegel, the president of the college, called and said, Bobby, we got everything approved for that rodeo club. And since this was your idea, you're in charge of it. Uh, and it wasn't my idea. And I told him, I said, no, no, no. I tried to explain, he said, well, no, tag, you're it. You're in charge of this rodeo club. <clears throat> I said, well, okay. And I already had you know, a full load. I thought from 7 in the morning to 11 at night, I had 30 minutes off for lunch. And then he threw this on me on top of all that. And uh, we had two meetings and they decided in that rodeo club that we need to have a rodeo team at Odessa College. So dummy me, I had to go find out what it would take to get a rodeo team started. You know, which is a whole other sporting event for the college. I went and found out, and they did everything they had to do, and we got a rodeo team started. And they called me, and I was going to be the main sponsor for the team, and I had to find a coach. Well, what I knew about rodeo was what I learned hanging around the rodeo grounds in Crane. Uh, when I was a kid, I never rodeoed at all. I mean, I, I rode some bulls or roped a few calves, but that was just for fun, and I wasn't supposed to be doing that, but I was doing it. My mama didn't want me out to ride bulls for sure. And um, Where did I, I, 
I had to find a coach, and I went and talked to Charlie McFadden, who was a rancher there in Crane. And I asked Charlie, I said, who do I need to find for a good be a good rodeo coach? And he told me, a guy, this Coach Watkins at Odessa High School, he was Odessa High School coach, rodeo coach, he was Odessa High School woodshop teacher. And I said, okay, and I said, now I'm gonna have to recruit somebody, start telling me some good kids in the West Texas to recruit a rodeo. And he said, well, what you need to do, you need to get a bull rider and build your program around a bull rider. I said, okay. And he said, the best bull rider in West Texas is Jim Sharp. He said, he's the best one in America. He said, but you won't get him. Because every college and university in the United States has got a rodeo team that's going to be recruiting. Because he's won the national championships in junior rodeos ever since he was seven years old all the way up to through high school. So everybody wants him. He said, you won't get him. I said, well, give me his phone number. I'll let's try to talk to him. So I got a hold of Jim Watkins and we hired him as a coach, rodeo coach. He did it the first year for free. We had no budget at all for the rodeo team. Uh, Jim had a practice event at his house, so they got to do the roping and bull riding practice at his house. I called Jim Sharp's house and I got his mother on the phone, told her who I was and what I wanted. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. I don't want Jim going off somewhere to college. I'd like to keep him close. Now, he lived in Kermit. And I said, well, I'd like to set up an appointment with him. So she said, we set up the time. And she brought him over to my office at OC. We got there and I asked her, I said, is there somewhere you can go for two or three hours while you sit down and talk to him? I didn't want to interview him with his mother around. Because I wanted to find out now. I figured maybe he'd be it really yeah, actually find out really what's going on. And uh, so she said, she had a daughter that lived here in Odessa and, and uh, she said, I'll go get her and take her to lunch and we'll go shopping or something. And I said, okay. So Jim and I sat down, we started talking and we just hit it right off. And uh, he ended up, before the day was over, I had him signed. Had a bull he was our first recruit. We had enough money, they did some car wash, they had enough money for one scholarship. Give three hundred dollars. Well, no, that was for the, the first rodeo we had. He uh, he got the first scholarship we had. Pro rodeo and uh, college rodeos is the only two that I know of in college where you can be a professional and, and still be an amateur in college. Huh. I didn't know that. His first year in college, he was doing college rodeo. And he was doing a pro rodeo on the pro rodeo circuit. He got a permit. They had to get a permit from somebody that's already on the pro circuit because he was leaving amateur high school rodeos in the, and AJ American Junior Rodeo Association going into the pros, PRCA. You have to have some five guys as members of PRCA to vouch for you that you're good character and you're good enough quality to even try out for it. And you're on a provisional thing. If you can make, you have to make so many rodeos your first year, and you have to earn so much money your first year, and then you get, they call it your, your tickets, your permit you carry around where you can enter any PRCA rodeo in the world. First month, Jim qualified. He earned enough money and made enough rodeos. One month. <laughs> uh, wow. The first three, he went three rodeos the first weekend. He, he did one college rodeo, he did a Thursday and a Friday at a college rodeo. Then he went to, flew to Florida, Friday night he flew to Florida. And Saturday morning he rode his bull at Florida. He yeah. left and he went to Louisiana and rode a bull there. And he left and went to Dallas and rode a bull there. And he won first place at Florida. And in Louisiana, he won second place in uh, Dallas. Made more money than he ever dreamed, you know, in junior rodeo, they would give belt buckles and, and little, if you're really big, saddles, or they might get five or $10 to help pay for gas money. 
I can't remember how much it was then. The Florida rodeos, Louisiana rodeos, the Dallas wasn't a big one. But it paid, uh, I think he came up with like $2,000 that weekend, which to him was all the money in the world. And then the next weekend he went and he won big and money kept coming in like it. And I was joking with him. I said, Jim, when you get to where you're making more money than you know what to do with it, let me know and I'll be your manager. And we just both laughed it off. Then I said, too, when you have a weekend where you make $5,000 on one weekend, you're taking me over to the barn door and buying me a steak. And he said, that's a deal. That was giving me some incentive. Next weekend, it is. he went and won over $5,000, so I got to go to the barn door with him. And when we're sitting at the barn door, he said, were you serious about being my manager? And I said, no, I really wasn't, I was joking. He said, well, I, I don't even have time to go to the bank. And he did, he was taking classes, he was doing college rodeos, he was doing pro rodeos all weekend. <clears throat> and he said, I need somebody just to kind of take care of my, my money. And I told him, uh, Jim, you got a mother and dad. Won't you let them know they don't know anything about business? And you know, Dad and I had businesses going, but we did that on the side. When I was teaching OC, we also owned jewelry business, and she owned a restaurant, and we sold fireworks, had fireworks stands we sold on holidays. Like I say, we had, we don't do one thing at a time. And uh, Jim knew that I was always busy with business, so I told him, I said, well, I'll, I'll help you out with it. I didn't know it was different. You know, I've learned how to succeed in life is don't know how, don't know that you can't do something, go ahead and do it before you find out you're not supposed to be able to do it. Nobody had ever been a manager and in rodeo before. He wanted to be at the Tennessee yeah, he won at Calgary. That was his. That was his second year. And he kicked Bobby Bill Buffer. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. A, That's yeah. a good look, but Bobby. I saw that belt. Oh yeah, sure. You don't just get those. That's the first belt buckle he won at the NFR his rookie year. He was a rookie of the year his first year. And that he. This is a go round buckle. He won uh, this first buckle he ever won at. The, at the national finals rodeo. And uh, this was a buckle he always wore till the next year he won the world's championship. And when he won the world's championship, they gave him his world's championship buckle. He took this buckle off his belt and put his world's champion buckle on. I'm trying not to cry when I say this. He gave me this for my good luck buckle. He said I wouldn't be here without you. So, you know, this is very special to me. And he hired a uh, timer. Yeah, but anyhow, we went ahead and I, I managed him. And I started I, getting and doing endorsements and stuff for him. And I told him, I said, Look, Jim, you guys are doing this stuff way too cheap. You guys were getting sponsored like for uh, Western wear stores that come in for a rodeo, they come in and do autographs and stuff and sign for people. They would give them a, a Western shirt or a pair of jeans for it. That's what they were paying, those, getting away with paying those guys. And I told Jim, I said, you know, football players and baseball players, they get big bucks to endorse products and, and businesses. And I said, you know, we need to get a little more. I said, if anybody asks you to do this stuff, I get I had some cards printed up. I said, "You give them my card and tell them to call me, and we'll set it up." So uh, he did. He, he started carrying my cards. Well, the next week I got a call from Pace Picante Sauce. They were in San Antonio then. They, they moved off now, but uh, they called me. And they, they said, "Jim said I'm supposed to call you. We want to use him to do some posters for uh, advertising." I said, okay. I said, what you got in mind? They said, well, we'll be a one-day shoot, and it's going to be him and Tuff Edelman. Tuff was a world champion that year. This was the year Jim was a rookie, rookie of the year. And uh, he said, well, we'll just we'll have him for about three or four hours doing a photo shoot, and they're going to use those photos to put on posters and, and banners and stuff, put in grocery stores by the picante sauce. And I said, okay. 
And I said, uh, what are you willing to pay for it? And the boy got real quiet on the other end of the line. He said, well, I don't know. What do you think? And I said, $5,000. And you pay for his airplane ticket there and back to Odessa, and you feed him while he's there. And then he really got quiet then. And he said, well, I'm going to have to talk to my boss about this. And I said, okay, go talk to him and you give me a call. Well, he called me back later that day. And said, well, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. Well, so Jim went ahead and did it. Jim rode on the, him and Tuff Edelman and Lane Frost and Cody Lambert were traveling together. Um, they get in one vehicle and they go to rodeos together and they were all competing against each other. You'd think they hated each other's guts, but they loved each other like brothers. Yeah. But they were, but to a lay crawl on the back of that bull is all the business. Uh, but at any rate, they were riding down the road this is like three weeks after they did that photo shoot. And uh, the checks came in. I got the check for, for Jim. And, uh, put it in the bank. I told Jim, I said, I got your check. But I had the bank. It was there in Crane. Deposit the bank in Crane. <clears throat> and uh, they were riding down the road, and Jim asked Tough, he said, Tough, what'd you do with your $5,000? No, he said, what'd you do with your money that you got paid for the Picante sauce? And he said, what are you talking about? He said, your paycheck. How much did they pay you? They didn't pay me that. He said, they, they, uh, I don't remember, they gave him some boots or something. And uh, he said, I really didn't need them. I already got boots. And uh, he said, did they give me boots or something? And Jim saw you your line. He said, no, that's what they paid me. He said, why? He said, well, they paid me $5,000. He said, oh, you're lying. I'm not going to say exactly how he said it, but he was a little nasty. But uh, it was BS is what it said. And uh, he said, Take it. you're the rookie of the year. I'm the world's champion. And I get a pair of boots and you get $5,000. He said, that is not, you're lying to me. He said, no, I'm serious. He said, no, you're not. And he said, look, show me the check. He said, well, I don't have it. Bob is deposited. So Jim got on the phone and he called me. And, and he said, tell Tough that that I got paid, and I told him, and Tuff said, no, you're lying. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, get it. I'll go back to the bank, and I'll have them Xerox a copy of that check, and I'll give a copy of Jim and let him show it to him. So he saw it. Well, then Tuff called me and said, well, you can be my manager. And he ended up all managing all four of those boys. And Lane and Tuff and Jim all ruled the bull riding for years. One was always the world's champion. They kind of take turns winning. And, uh, and then we ended up, the last guy I recruited at OC was Ty Murray. Everybody said I couldn't get him, but me and Jim got him recruited, Jim Short. And uh, Ty Murray, I ended up managing him uh, until, oh, I, I quit managing when, when Lane Frost got killed at, uh, uh, All right. No, where was that? They got killed at Dan Gully. It's in Wyoming. Gully can't remember which one it was. I will forget when he got killed. Jim Sharp called me and told me. And Jim was crying. Uh, after that, I just I didn't want it anymore. You know, I just I, I and they were all you know getting pretty well established and everything. I told y'all to start handling it on your own. And uh, Tom Murray, he found him one. He started dating Jewel. He ended up marrying her, the singer. And him and Jewel used the same business manager when I told him to find somebody else because I couldn't go. You know, I was busy in Crane. I couldn't do all the stuff. It got too big for me. Uh, there's another thing that happened. There's an accident. We had the rodeo at Odessa, the Odessa rodeo, and they all came in together. And we're sitting in my office visiting at OC, and they were talking about the bull, big bull rides they have at Del Rio. And uh, 
they were mentioning it was just a bull ride and it paid $50,000 for the winners, a winner take all bull ride. It's a big deal at Del Rio. And they got to talk about they'd kind of like to have something like that in their hometowns, just bull rides. So we were talking it over and everything, and I said, well, you know, it's going to take a lot of corporate sponsorship to pull something like that off. You know, we had to get some big bucks on that. And they said, well, find out what it takes. So I did some checking around. I called out here to the Standard Sales is a Budweiser distributor. And I asked to talk to somebody there. I told them what we was wanting to do. And they said, well, probably what you need, you need to get with the national. He said, I'll get you hooked up with them. And um, they ended up, the, the office out of Houston is the one that we negotiated with. It's the nearest Budweiser, big dealer, where the brewery was. Told them what we wanted to do. And they got all excited. Because that same year, Anna, uh, Coors got exclusive with PR with a yeah, PRCA that they would be the only beer company that could advertise at their rodeos. And the barrels that, like the barrel racers have, had the names on it. Had the, the Coors beer on it. Well, used to some of them had Budweiser and then some of them had Coors, and if the rodeo was different. Well, Coors got it hooked up where they would be exclusive for all the rodeos. That totally kicked Bush out. Well, Bush was upset somewhat. And they said, we're real interested. And I, and I told them what we kind of want to do. We said, we got people that all they do is put together promotion stuff like this. We'll get you together and we'll try out some stuff. We said, we'll have like three rodeos and we'll try them. So the first three that we did, the bull rides that we did, uh, we did one at, at Odessa. Jim was from Kermit, but Kermit didn't have any place big enough, so we did one at, at uh, uh, the College Center for Odessa. And we did one in El Paso, which is where Taff Eden was from. We did one up in uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma, for Lane Frost. And we did one in Dallas area for Cody Landman, because he was from that area. It worked real good. And they said, okay, we want to make this bigger. This is when we started the PBR. It was all an accident. It started in my office at Odessa College. Huh. Just talking about having local yokel bull rides for the local boys and the PBR generated from that. Took off. And that, they called me the godfather of the PBR. <laughs> and it was actually, it was all owned by the original guys those four, and they went and talked to all their other buddies, the top people in it. The bull riders themselves own the PBR. Now, I had a partnership in it too, but it was primarily owned by the bull riders. And they run it that way through a contract with Budweiser. Budweiser hooked up back in those days, it was TNN, Tennessee, or was it? That Nashville network. Isn't that what it was? A turn, TNT. Turn, yeah. Uh, Whatever it is. The it, it was Nashville network. It's, it did bump now, it's not around anymore. Turner, was it? The Turner had a part of that. They, the, the, but they started, they started airing all the PBR bull rides on that network. And Budweiser always sponsored them and everything. So it, that's when things really started going big. And it ended up we sold out to uh, Ford, bought it all out. But, uh, that's how it started. But everything was like an accident. Like I say, when you don't know you can't do something, you can do it. You just don't even think about doing it. Just go ahead and do it. You got to some good guys on that. I remember the names. Yeah, but they were they, all. The one that was most successful after his all final was was uh, Tom Murray. He won more than anybody. And uh, and the hill the hill. They all each other. close. They yeah. live close to each other. Down there in well, Stephenville area. Which one was killed? In a, you mentioned one I was killed. Lane in. Frost was killed. At, golly, I can't believe was it. Was it during a, was it a competition? It was a bull ride, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he got the horn. The horn, he's the one they made the movie about. Yeah. Horn hit him in the ribs, it broke his rib and a rib. Punctured. Punctured, yeah. And he actually bled to death. 
uh, it, it's several main artery, any internal and internal. We sell the teacher too. We sell the teacher. Yeah, that's one of the first projects I did with Jim. Me and Jim went together as partners. It's called PRTA, Pro Rodeo Talent Associates. Jim and I were partners in that. We we did uh, make t-shirts and stuff. I thought it, you do that, you know, all the other sports were doing that, selling shirts and caps and stuff. Uh, yeah. Nobody did that in rodeo yet. We did, like I say, we didn't, I didn't know better. And we did so good we couldn't handle it and I couldn't do all the stuff. And what we finally did is, instead of us, I was printing them in crayon and we were trying to ship them on buses a week ahead of time to the rodeos and had people there to sell them. We finally found a couple that was doing that for us and then uh, found out it's it a whole lot better just to contract it out. We found other companies that do the screen printing and let them print it and just pay us royalties. Yeah. And we oh, didn't yeah. have to do all the hassle. We just drew royalties off of it. Yeah. Like I say, that never been done before. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's good to be on the ground floor, so that stuff. Yeah. But uh, to this day, we're all close. I mean, I, I get phone calls from them all the time. And he comes see us. In fact, Jim and Frank's in Kermit right now. He's helping his dad work. He called me last and week. And he retirement would be good. Yeah, they all retired well. I invested their money for them, and uh, they all retired pretty well yeah, off. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, because they made more money off in the long run, more money off of their uh, endorsements than they did riding, and all of them made over a million dollars a year yeah. riding. Plus, when we started the PBR, now it made PRCA mad at me. They didn't, they were pretty upset with me because we took away from their system a lot. Yeah. We had asked PRCA, and this might sound a lot political because it kind of was political, but we had asked for more things and wouldn't get it. Most people, when they go to the rodeo, they're going to watch the Bronx and the Bull Riders. And half the time, we're hoping somebody gets hurt. I hate to say it, but yeah. that's what. You know, to see a crash or somebody, and but that's the exciting part. To most people, the roping and stuff is okay, but it's not that exciting to them. Well, you know, it's a very dangerous sport. It's not, are you going to get hurt? It's when and how often. And uh, we asked for more bullfighters. What they were doing, they were only hire like at, at the big rodeos. They'd have two bullfighters. Smaller rodeos, they don't have one. Well, those guys get tired. They're out there running, and you know that's a very, very, very dangerous job. They're the ones when the bull riders dismount or get thrown off. They make sure that bull don't get to him until he can get out of the arena. They'll put themselves between the bull and their body between yeah. the bull and the bull rider and take the blows. Uh, and those guys doing all the running around, they get tired. And when they get tired, then they get hurt or the bullfighters or bull riders are gonna get hurt. So we asked, we kept asking for more bull ride, bullfighters. And they the PRCA never would do it. But when we set up the PBR, we had the minimum of three bullfighters there. And the bigger ones would have four. That way they could take turns and we wouldn't be tired. And then we got that Justin Healers. We had, always had to have a trainer there. There was a doctor there on scene at every bull ride in case somebody got hurt. Mm -hmm. Justin Book Company came up with what they call it, Justin Healers. They had a trailer where they could go out and x-ray him and everything right there. Had the doctor and everything right there at the rides. Which, you know, again, yeah. that was safe. And then we got the more companies do more sponsorships where we did their finals at the rodeos and all the hotels and stuff would sponsor the, each bull rider there had hotel sponsor them. they put them up in the hotels we had where sponsors were paying the traveling expenses where they could fly back and forth to the bull rides it wasn't out of their pocket anymore they had sponsors paying it so everything they won they got to keep so it ended up you know Everybody wanted to be in PBR because they could make a lot more money. And they didn't want to participate in PRCA. And PRCA started going down because everybody was trying to go to PBR. But we had only get the top 50 guys in the PBR. If you didn't make the top 50, you couldn't ride PBR. 
Do you still do anything with the group stuff? No, I told you, I'd like to say when Lane got killed, I did just like that took a win out of my sails. Uh, I always worried about those guys anyhow. And, uh, and I could tell tales I want, but I could tell you lots of tales. So I, used, I used to go on the road with them sometimes. She owned a little burger joint by the school called The Bird. And I was sitting in The Bird one day. On a Friday afternoon, I just got off work. And Jim and Jim Sharp and Ty Murray come by. Buy steaks. Get a hamburger. <laughs> they used to bring steaks. They'd buy steaks. And Odessa would bring because my son, some child, cooked steaks better than anybody they knew of. And they eat steaks all over the United States. And, and he was the best there. So Richard, the door. So when we clawed, we checked the door so it didn't have to be a... Didn't have a beer and <laughs> But anyway, they come in one afternoon and pick me up. They had told us, I said, we're going to kidnap him this evening. They had sent Angelo to the He ended up a week and a half later, I got home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know. I thought I was going to send Angelo back, too. But, you had but I, I took several trips with them. Yeah, it, it, was, it was really interesting and uh, hard life. Yeah. It's all travel. You don't really get to see, you know, like you go to all these exciting places, well, they don't get to see or do anything. And Jimmy always good when he go out of town, he always call Bobby. Yeah, he called me and let me know how Bobby was time. doing every. And a lot of times, if I wasn't available, of course, we didn't have cell phones a lot back then. Jim did. I didn't have them. Cell phones were real expensive and hard to come by. And uh, Jim had a cell phone. He couldn't get me to call my dad, but my dad loved it because he'd have a world champion call me and tell him how, how everything was going on the road. That's pretty good. My dad ate that up. I bet it did. He never, my dad never actually got to meet any of them in person. Really? No, never did. He talked to them on the phone, but he never ever met any of them that I can remember. He might have met Jim once, but I don't think he ever met any of them. Oh, but he wow. talked to him on the phone. And he'd be impressed that they called him. That was fun, Bill. So what are you doing these days? I'm retired. We had a jewelry store there for a while. When I left OC, I, I did jewelry work. And it was a combination. You can only do it in Grain, Texas, a t-shirt and jewelry store combination. Again, we do. nobody was doing crane shirts, so I, I had already been doing the, the shirts for the bull riders, and they saw how I did that, and there was a lady there that had a t-shirt shop that didn't ever take off good, and she had the equipment, she wanted to sell it. They bought it, I didn't even know. I looked up one day, I was working at the workbench, working on jewelry, and I looked up, and my boys were hauling stuff into my store building. <laughs> Uh, and I said, what are we doing? And she said, well, I just bought the t-shirt business. I thought, oh, good. Well, at first year, I thought, well, maybe it'll help pay our electric bill. It, it ended up that day. first year. The first weekend, we paid off our equipment. Wow. And I started coming up with more designs. And it ended up, I made more money selling t-shirts than I did in the jewelry business. Because huh. I, I did for McCamey and... Oh, yeah. R.N. and Rankin. Cheerleader and, and, and all that. Yeah, and I did cheerleader. Yeah, that's a big business. Yeah. It, it, it got busy. And I'm only one in class. Yeah, we were the only ones. So we quit everybody moving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there's several people selling now. But, uh, Before nobody wanted to put yeah. it, cut it. Well, didn't think it'd work. Probably. Nobody probably figured that it'd make enough money to And, yeah, so he, to do, uh, and he do a uh, computer too. You know, I had to the do side. all the artwork. Uh, artwork. Oh, and see, so you have to come up with a new style every year, and I try to do at least three styles every new styles every year. Because if you don't come up with something new, they won't. They'll just wear last year's shirt. Uh, yeah. So you got to have something new every year. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's business. That's marketing. Marketing, yeah, branding. And, uh, I started doing with a friend of mine here in Odessa, letting him do the screen print for me, and. Uh, People would come in, he did for Permian, he did for OHS, he did for Midland Lee and Midland High, and some of the, and Andrew, some of the other area schools. Well, they started seeing my crane artwork, and they started talking to me, and I started, I did a lot of Andrew's artwork for their shirts, and Midland Lee and Permian, and uh, my buddy in here in Odessa did the printing, but I did the design work. And I told God, here I am, the graphics, 
designer and never intended to do that either. Actually, that was all I said. We have copyright, and so nobody can use our design. Oh, yeah. That's, that's why. All the look. crane stuff, the, the crane logo, the original crane logo that everybody knows, us old timers know, this crane standing on one leg. Yeah. My grandfather drew that. Really? And he got a copyright on it. He was on the school board. My grandfather was one of the first school boards Crane had. And he was on the school board the day he died. He died in 19, December 1947, just before I was born in 48. Um, he was also a songwriter. He wrote gospel songs, he published in a lot of really? uh, song books, gospel books. Uh, so he was used to copywriting stuff, and he he drew that crane for our mascot. The uh -huh. kids voted. You know, this is cool. Back in those days, you know, when my dad and him came here, there wasn't a school when they started school. So they had, to, well, what's going to be our mascot? The kids all voted on our mascot. Well, we're town's named Grace, and we're going to call ourselves the Cranes. And then they decided what colors we're going to do, and they decided on purple and gold. So we you know, instead of purple cranes, or the golden cranes. Yeah. But the kids all voted on and decided on all that stuff. Really? You have to vote. I didn't know that. And you know, we have got an original, our school song is an original song. You know, we go to other football games, you listen to other town's songs, and they're playing, I've yeah. been working on the railroad, or they got. Uh, oh, yeah, and I, and one of the, fight, the all class. Notre Dame you. fight song, I think. A lot of them use that. And one of the all class reunions, they were talking about uh, uh, Mrs. Tobin. She was 15 years old at the time. She introduced that song yep. in school. She sang it as a 15 year old kid. The, uh, that's, the way this song. happened, my grandpa, he was, like I say, he's, he's interested in music. And he had did vaudeville, him and his brother, in the young days, back in the early 1900s. And when they were hiring a band director, I believe it was the second band director Crane had. My grandpa told him, he said, we'll hire you, we'll give you a one year contract. But part of the stipulation is you're gonna to have to write us a school song that's original. And he said, if you can write us a good school song that everybody likes, we'll, keep, we'll probably give you another contract next year. That's part of your contract. Is you're gonna to have to write a school song. That how so he wrote, the, 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 the band director actually wrote the music to it. The kids started coming up with the, the words, and my grandpa helped them with the lyrics out of time, man, because like I said, he was, he was good at that. Yeah. But the, and then the, the kids actually voted on whether or not to use that for a school song, and of course they all voted on it. They liked it. <laughs> but that's what I'm getting at. The kids always had a say so for it. Mascot was, what the colors was, or school song, uh, and we're original. Yeah, Nobody yeah, else has got what a, we got. A unique song, isn't it? Yep. Well, that's pretty, I didn't know where that song came from. I, I think I'd heard somewhere in the past, but that's pretty neat. And the and the crying, the uh, actual. Oh, there's. How the, beautiful. The bank used that crying, if you remember, is on all the checks. Uh -huh. My grandfather gave him permission to do that. They gave him a $25 uh, savings bond, uh -huh. U.S. savings bond, for permission to use that crane on the checks. That was I his got, payment for I it. still got my check from uh, uh, Tom, Barnes. Tom Barnsley. Yeah. I kept that mine. Uh, it's got the crane. I've got a Xerox copy of mine. <laughs> oh, my God. Dow's got a book that Tom gave her. It's a, a book that he got for free that you could pick up in the uh, grocery stores by oh, a salad dressing company used to have them stuff where I could use salad dressing and her recipes. It's a free recipe book you can pick up. Tom's always getting stuff like that free. And he, draws. he got that and he gave it to Dow and signed really? it. And he said, Dow I couldn't afford to buy you once I picked this up. Couldn't afford to buy one. And, <laughs> and he draw the cowboy. The hat, yeah, oh, of course, yeah. he was smiling. If he was in a good mood, he'd put the smiley face on it. If he thought you charged too much or something, he signed, he'd put a frowny face really? on it. Really? Yeah. Well, probably 
Yeah, we better go. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so y'all still live in Crane? Yep. All right. Well, good. We're well, just going to be there until the day we're gone. Well, it's a good place to be. <laughs> good place to be. Thank you very much. And I've got a grandson that's a senior at Crane this year playing football. He's the first fourth generation Crane football player. Oh, dear. All right. My dad plays on the first football okay, team. He's my dad graduated. Okay, that's not bad. That's not my, my brother and I play football, so there's two generations. My son played football at Grand Rapids Three, so Pat's the fourth. He's little Pat. My dad is Pat. This is little Pat. Little Pat. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Well, thank you. I enjoyed that. That was that was interesting. I knew it would get too long. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> well, see, I'm glad you so much. We're going to take her phone or something to eat. It's about dinner time, isn't it? Yeah.